Hello everyone, and welcome to our next episode of Umineko. Uh, hold on, let me just set up the sound and stuff. There we go. Generally it helps if you can hear the game that we're playing. Uh, so to start off, I want to do a quick recap for anyone who's joining us late. Um, I need to also turn off my own volume, or turn it down at least. Because it's loud. There we go. Uh, and a uh, pretty heavy content warning for this episode in regards to the uh, child abuse. So, you know, uh, if you don't want to deal with anything regarding that, look after yourself and uh, go watch or do something fun. That's actually, you know, good for you instead of uh, doing this that to yourself. Um, you know, just be careful. Because it's it's pretty rough in this one. Uh, let's see. It's been kind of slightly hinted at before if you've seen the other episodes, but it it shit goes down. Um, so be warned. Uh, as for the recap, uh, this is our protagonist, Battler. It's a weird name. Uh, he knows it. He hates it. Uh, he's rejoining his family after being essentially out of it for six years to go to the family conference. The reason he left is because his dad, Rudolf, married uh, his battler's stepmom, Kirie, uh, pretty much immediately after battler's mom died, and he was very pissed off about that. Uh, the whole family is fucking rich. Uh, several members of them live on an island, and that's where the conference is being held. Um, the whole family went there on a, an airplane and a boat, so it's very remote. Um, there's also a typhoon on the way, so that's fun. The head of the family, Kinzo, is still alive despite being told he had three months to live a year ago. He's basically locked himself up in his room and is mostly screaming and rambling about black magic rituals. He's also rumored to have been given 10 tons of gold by a witch. Like a legit actual magical witch. He's also commissioned a portrait of the witch, Beatrice, and ha he had it placed in the hallway of his mansion. Uh, in addition to a, and I quote, creepy and very long epitaph. We don't know what's in there yet, um, but hey, we may, we may find out. The kids of the family, George, Jessica, Battler, and Maria, are on their way to the beach right now with uh, one of the servants. And the adults, uh, that's a lot of people, and I want to get going, so I won't go through all of them. Uh, the adults had a very tense, long discussion about money. Um, the younger three of the siblings tried to ste uh, scheme money out of the eldest, uh, and it did not go great. Uh, their entire plot hinged on the, on the ten tons of gold being present on the island, uh, but as it turns out, they're all in massive money problems, and not as rich as they're making themselves out to be. Uh, and that gave... Uh, the eldest sibling the upper hand so things are really fucking tense right now uh, and there's been a lot of arguing uh, meanwhile Kinzo the head of the family is locked up in his room and probably complaining about his idiot children like last time uh, I'm just gonna take a sip of my tea and then uh, we're gonna start reading Hmm. <laughs> 
quite an entertaining scheme. Well then, what are the conditions they've attached? Well, whether or not Krausama actually delivers the gold, you'll pay Eva-sama, Rudolf-sama, and Rosa-sama a total of 7.5 billion yen for their shares. However, 10% of that will be paid before March. <laughs> Kraus, you dunce. To think he would have his feet swept out from under him by his younger siblings. How truly amusing. But it sounds as though they tripped when going in for the kill, yes? Yes. Kraus-sama exposed the fact that Eva-sama and the younger siblings all have an urgent need to get money. <laughs> Is there even any need to expose such obvious fact? That irresolute, incompetent man. What are they doing now? That conversation has been put on hold for the time being. Now Beatrice's, Beatrice Sama's epitaph is being discussed. So they're trying to solve the riddle and find out where my gold is hidden? Yes. Kinzo set down his spectacles and snorted. Will the miracle be fulfilled first? Or will those fools expose the gold first? What a show this will be. At the very moment those fools solve my puzzle, I will suffer utter defeat. They can suck my corpse down to the last fragment of bone. The greed of fools can allow great magic to bring forth a miracle. And yet, if the fulfillment of the miracle comes first, if it comes first, Beatrice will be resurrected again. The smile I have been chasing half my life will be restored. Oh, Beatrice, soon will come the sacred night when we shall bet upon a miracle, and the game of demons shall begin. I will surely prove tri triumphant and survive. I'll let you have the lives of all those others. I don't need wealth, or honor, or assets, or gold, or anything. All I want is to see your smile one last time. <laughs> Kinzo choked, apparently in great pain. Kanon got closer and tried to pat his master's back, but Kinzo motioned for him to stop. Do you know why I went to the trouble of exposing the hidden location of the gold in a place that everyone can see? No. It is because magical power is determined by risk. If the number of people who try to discover Beatrice's gold is great, and the danger of them succeeding is great as well, then the power of the magic will bring about a grand miracle if we succeed despite the odds. In other words, magic is a game. It is not the case that the one who performs the best becomes the victor. The victor performs the best because he has been granted magic. Do you see? It is similar to how the miracle of life can be granted only after winning against the divine odds of several hundred million to one. Is this still a little difficult for you? My apologies. That's fine. It all comes down to this. I will give all that I have built up to the one who solves the mystery of Beatrice's epitaph. Wealth, honor, gold and the inheritance of the Ushiromiya family, everything that I have established. My children certainly aren't the only ones with the right to attempt to solve this riddle. Anyone who solves the riddle will have the right to gain everything, even you. Yes. However, I couldn't possibly understand such a difficult riddle. Of course, I made it difficult. But you must try to solve it as well. That will form the seed that summons the miracle of my magic. If everyone attempts it, and everyone fails, that will be that. However, if the miracles come together and give birth to magical power, it will happen. Beatrice will revive. That is why you must attempt it too. Everyone must attempt it. And in doing so, they will give strength to my magic. Do you understand? Yes. I will try. For a long while, Kinzo re repeatedly muttered to himself, agitated and clutching at his head. Khan stayed where he was, 
alert and unmoving, until he was given the next order from his master. Kinzo eventually realized this. Very well, leave me. There is a bag of sweets on the liquor cabinet. You can take some with you as a reward. I'm fine. After all, I am furniture. Hmm. So, furniture doesn't eat sweets? Well, I suppose it stands to reason. In that case, leave me. Yes, excuse me. Kanon bowed and left the study. As the door closed, a heavy locking noise sounded out. But it was not the sound of Kanon locking the door. It was the door locking automatically. No one could enter without Kinzo's permission, and once they left, they could not enter again. It was a mechanism that Kinzo, unable to trust his blood relatives, had created to seal himself up in his own study and isolate himself from the outside world. He was una already unable to trust anyone excepting, not the children who shared his blood, but those servants who called themselves furniture. That was a tricky sentence. Nanjo-sama, how are you feeling? Ah, Genshi-san. Oh, it's just that there's no place for me to be anymore. With a bitter laugh, Nanjo turned to face the door to the parlor. That look was apparently enough to tell Genji what Nanjo wanted to say. For the most part, Genji also understood the family situation. It must have made him want to frown knowing that right now in the lounge, the master he served was being discussed so disrespectfully. But it would have been very difficult to gather that from his indifferent expression. Still, I don't understand. Why did Kinzo-san have something so provocative written, I wonder? Nanjo looked at the portrait of Beatrice. No, he actually directed his gaze beneath the portrait, at the plate with the epitaph. I do not presume to understand the master's thoughts. However, I'm sure he had a deep reason for doing so. Since long ago, when Kinzo-san played chess, he would always prepare his moves according to some far-reaching judgment. Yes, sometimes even to make moves I couldn't understand. For an average person like me, it was impossible to see through whatever it was that he was planning. Sometimes I wonder if this might be some kind of will in the master's eyes. Perhaps he wishes to hand it over, to hand over his wealth and title to the one who can understand it. So you're thinking he may have wanted the four siblings to work together and solve the riddle before some outsider like myself solved it? Kinzo-san may speak of his children in insulting terms, but. Perhaps he also wants them to repair their relationship. It certainly would be heartwarming if, as Nanjo had suggested, this epitaph had been made to repair the sibling's relationship. However, both Nanjo and Genji knew that nothing could be more impossible than this. They'd known Kinzo longer than anyone, and Kinzo trusted them more than his own, than his own relatives but even they could not guess at his true motives. The master always says that everyone has the right to try and solve the riddle, even if they aren't a member of this family. His family. What about you, Dr. Nanjo? No, oh, no, it's, it's a little too difficult a puzzle for this senile old man. Actually, I once wrote this epitaph down on my notebook. Night after night, I would try to solve it before going to sleep. But <laughs> it really is hard. It looks like we might have some free time to relax and consider it before someone comes to get us. What do you say, Kenji-san? 
I am nothing more than furniture in service to the master. Gold and assets are unnecessary to me. My, you're very modest. I can imagine that's why Kinzo-san trusts you so much. If so, I am honored. As Nanjo lightly laughed in response, he once again looked at the epitaph. Behold the sweet fish river running through my beloved hometown. You who seek the golden land, follow its path downstream in search of the key. The epitaph on the portrait called My Beloved Witch Beatrice goes as follows. Behold the sweet fish river running through my beloved hometown. You who seek the golden land, follow its path downstream in search of the key. As you travel down it, you will see a village. In that village, look for the shore the two will tell you of. There sleeps the key to the Golden Land. The one who obtains the key must then travel to the Golden Land in accordance with these rules. On the first twilight, offer the six chosen by the key as sacrifices. On the second twilight, those who remain shall tear apart the two who are close. On the third twilight, those who remain shall praise my noble name. On the fourth twilight, gouge the head and kill. On the fifth twilight, gouge the chest and kill. On the sixth twilight, gouge the stomach and kill. On the seventh twilight, gouge the knee and kill. On the eighth twilight, gouge the leg and kill. On the ninth twilight, the witch shall revive, and none shall be left alive. On the tenth twilight, at journey's end, you shall, you shall attain to the power of the Golden Land's treasures, once and for the last time. The witch shall praise the wise and bestow four treasures. One shall be all the gold from the Golden Land. One shall be the resurrection of all the dead souls. One shall be the resurrection of the love that was lost. One shall be the p to put the witch to sleep for all time. Sleep peacefully, my beloved witch, Beatrice. Hey, please. Welcome to the stream. You just got, you just got in to the part where it gets juicy and creepy shit starts uh, happening a little bit. And now we're gonna go back right to the wholesome stuff. I think. Well, that was cool. Um, that wasn't in the uh, original. Uh, some being extra, hit extra hard with the nostalgic feels. Uh, anyway, um, Fleece, have you caught the other thingies, or, or do you want a recap? Because I can do that. If not, I'm just going to keep trucking. And I'm also going to drink some tea. So, on the tenth twilight, the journey ends, and you reach the Golden Land. You really are di diligent, Maria. You did a good job writing all this down. Ooh. I forget a lot, so I always write things down. Mama told me to. There is a notebook inside the handbag Maria was always carrying around, and Beatrice's epitaph was copied onto it. Thanks to that, we were all able to challenge the puzzle of the epitaph while walking down this beach. Jessica and the rest had already tried to solve it several times, and had already gotten bored with it. However, since this was a first for me, I was so excited that I couldn't stop. It really tickled my sense of adventure. Let's start with the first line. Behold the sweet fish river running through my beloved hometown. 
Where was grandfather's hometown again? I heard that before the war, the Ushirumiya family had a mansion near Odawara. Which makes you want to know which Sweetfish River flows through Odawara, right? Yeah, because that river would be the starting place. Anyone searching for the Golden Land would head down that and search for the key. What's this river in Odawara? Does it have Sweetfish swimming in it? If you're looking for Sweetfish in Odawara, it'd have to be Hayakawa. It's famous for its mountain stream fishing. Ooh, I hate fish. <laughs> Maria, you'll understand when you get a bit older. Look, 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 salty roasted sweet fish. Yummy. Even though we just ate, I'm getting hungry again. What? Um, shall I bring you a biscuit? Huh? Oh, sorry, that's not what I meant. Don't mind it. I don't get it. Shannon John was faithfully keeping his company, since she didn't have any afternoon chores for a while. I would have thought that, since she's a servant, accompanying us would force her to take care of us and tie her out, but that didn't seem to be the case for her. On the contrary, she seemed to enjoy joining in on a conversation with people close to her age. When I asked, I heard that she was the sort of worker whose room and board were supplied by her employer. So normally, the only person close to her in age was Jessica. Yeah, I can imagine how that might be pretty, pretty dull. Okay, so I get that the sweet fish filled river near Odawara is Hayakawa. In that case, we've got to go down it. Do you find anything if you head down Hayakawa River? Um, if you follow it downstream, you'll arrive at the ocean. Of course, you'd reach the mouth of the river. And the third line of the epitaph was, as you travel down it, you'll see a village. By the way, since long ago, the mouths of rivers have been key points in transportation, and large cities tend to be built there. That'd be the next checkpoint. Hmm, that's a pretty good theory. Just like you guessed, there's an old city there that was very prosperous in ancient times. That's where Odawara Castle is. Ah, I think I might have gone to Odawara Castle on a field trip once. It really was a wonderful castle. Yeah, I also went there. Even though I live in a western-style house, it's true that Japanese people feel comfortable with the Japanese layout. Ooh, castles are boring. Theme parks are better. Ooh. I see, I see. Okay. If we find the gold, the great Battler-sama will generously reserve a whole theme park for a day and let you play in it. Still, Otawara Castle, huh? The hidden goal of Odawara Castle. <laughs> it's actually starting to sound pretty good. <laughs> well, we figured out that much two years ago. The village down the river where the sweet fish swim in Odawara. We figured it was probably somewhere near Odawara Castle. The problem is the next line. Okay, let's see where Battler's strange reasoning can take him. Jessica grinned broadly. She seemed to be implying that she would have solved the puzzle long ago if it was that easy. Damn it. I'll definitely find it and keep it all to myself. The fourth line. In that village, look for the shore the two will tell you of. I don't know what it means by the two, but anyway. The shore. What does it mean by the shore? No, wait. Is there any place near there with Shore or Kishi in its name? Um, I've heard there's a place called Soga Kishi in Odawara. Huh? Wow, you sure know a lot about it. <laughs> what could that mean? Shannon John, are you trying to solve the riddle and get the gold too? That makes us rivals. It, it's not like I'm interested in gold. It's just that... George Sama told me about it before. That's because we reached the same conclusion two years ago. We even went to the trouble of laying out a map and looking it up. It was about five kilometers to the north of Odawara. We definitely found a place called Sogakishi there. 
However, after that, we get stuck. The fifth line doesn't say where the key is hidden in that place. Maria-chan, Maria could you read it for us? Ooh. There sleeps the... Key to the Golden Land. Ooh. I could read it. So Kakishi is probably large, and there wasn't ever any house built there by the Ushiromiya family. Not much we can do to find a key in such a vast area without any hints. You're right. And without the key, we can't advance to the next line. George Aniki, what kind of place is Sokakishi? Let's see. I've never been there, so I don't really know. But according to the map, it's in the mountains. I'm pretty sure it was at the base of Mount Asama. Hmm. Something doesn't feel right. You'd expect a riddle pointing the way to hidden gold to be a bit more exact. I get the feeling that the, even the part about Sokakishi was a mistake. Well, I think it could be Sokakishi. It could be talking about some house that Grandfather lived in when he was a kid that we don't know about. After all, the first line mentioned his beloved hometown. Shannon, you served Grandfather alcohol and stuff lots of times, right? Hasn't he ever talked to you about his past? The Master almost never speaks of the past. However, he talks of the Great Kanto Earthquake as though it was someone else's story. So he may have been living far away from the Kanto area. The Ushiromiya family may have been living in Odawara, but not all of the branch families were. Grandfather often called himself part of a branch of a branch family the least connected to the successor. And that means the beloved hometown might not even be Odawara at all. I've never heard anything about grandfather's hometown, and I doubt he'd actually tell me if I asked. If the so-called beloved hometown isn't referring to the Ushiromiya family's roots, then the Odawara theory is wrong from the beginning. Of course, this doesn't completely remove the possibility that it was Sogakishi. For example, perhaps he lived in Odawara when he was very young, but then moved away far later. Far away later. Ugh. I don't understand what you're all talking about. Ugh. Maria had been completely left out of the conversation, and she now sat puffing her cheeks out in boredom. So basically... If we can't even agree on the starting point for this dice game of gold, we're totally stuck. But wait. After the first five lines, the thing we end up finding is a key, right? Even if you don't have a key, it's always possible to bust through a door. Can't we just skip the first five lines and start figuring out the rest? Ooh, I hadn't thought of that. Oh well, we're just wasting time anyway. Let's hear the rest of Battler's reasoning. But in the next part, it gets dark really fast. Shen Chan frowned slightly. After looking back at Maria's notebook to recall what was written there, yeah, I was forced to agree. On the first twilight, all for the six chosen by the key as sacrifices. It sure does get horrible quickly. On the second twilight, it says to tear apart the two who are close. Does that mean to make them break off their loving relationship? Or does it mean to literally tear them apart? I don't know, but either way, it's pretty disgusting. Even if we set that second line aside, it mentions six people for the first twilight, then five people for the fourth through eighth, eighth twilights. So at least 11 people must be sacrificed. Ooh, they're sacrifices to revive Beatrice. I see. Sacrifices to restore the witch. Yeah, that's what it'd mean. Near the end, the witch will be revived in the ninth twilight. That last part is guaranteed. On the ninth twilight, the witch shall revive and none shall be left alive. So everyone will die in the end. And after that, the 10th twilight is the goal line. 
I'm not sure how you're supposed to reach the Golden Land if everyone's dead by then. Depending on how you interpret it, the traveler who holds the key may or may not be included in the none shall be left alive part. But at the end, there's something pretty interesting. After reaching the goal, the witch gives out four treasures. One shall be all the gold. The problem is the next one. It says that dex the dead souls will be res resurrected, right? Doesn't that sound like it means everybody who died in the earlier lines? If you put it like that, then the part about reviving lost love might refer to the pair torn apart on the second twilight. That's right, and the fourth one refers to the ninth twilight. The fourth treasure is putting the witch, revive on the ninth twilight, to sleep. If you put a happy spin on all this, it'll be hectic with people dying and breaking up all over the place, but it'll all be made right in the end. The awakened witch will sleep again, and everything will be like it was at the start, except with a huge pile of gold. The witch must be pretty busy with all the killing, reviving, breaking up, and reuniting people. Not to mention waking up and sleeping. <laughs> Sheesh, just when the tale of the hidden gold was getting interesting, it all gets pretty dubious once the witch starts showing up. Too true. Oh well, thanks for dropping by, Felice. I hope uh, I hope you have a good day, and I hope that your internet stops acting up. I laughed along with Jessica. After all, the idea of a witch was just too ridiculous. Of course, once we started laughing like that, Maria, who believed in the witch, got angry. Ooh, the witch is incredible. She can do anything with magic, even kill, even bring back to life, even give love, even take it. She can fly in the sky, can become invisible, can even make gold and bread out of nothing. Ooh, ooh, ooh. <laughs> uh, dang, my bad, we were just joking. Jessica apologized, sticking out her tongue, but Maria did not accept it. She grabbed her notebook back out of my hands and, opening to some other pages, tried to prove that the witch existed. Those pages had colorful drawings of witches on them, and well conveyed the fantastical image Maria had of witches. It wasn't the normal sinister image of a crooked-nosed ha hag flying around on a broom, but a dreamlike person with unnatural powers, who could do anything and wore a beautiful dress. It was just what you'd expect from an imaginative, imaginative young girl. Flitting through the sky, crossing a rainbow, dancing around all night with a teacup and a teapot that would never get empty, no matter how much you poured out of it. With a flourish of her staff, the stars in the sky would become candy and pour down, and the flowers that pr produced sweets would bud by the roadside. To Maria, witches were the only concept that could embody the magical dream that so captivated her. As she grew older, it was the last remaining thing that could give richness to her dull and plain everyday life. That's why Maria believed in witches. She didn't want that dream of hers to be tarnished. That's why she didn't want anyone to tarnish the epitaph, which affirmed the existence of witches. Because the witch named Beatrice is Maria's dream. To Maria Chum, the epitaph isn't a guide to the hidden gold, but magic to revive the witch. So it was the single link between Maria and the witch. My R Maria was very angry and clung to George Aniki. Jessica and I scratched our heads and apologized. It might not be possible to smooth things over again like the time she got mad in front of the portrait. Maria didn't seem willing to be easily consoled. Unlike Jessica and I, who hung our heads wondering what to do, Shannon Chum timidly opened her mouth. Um, Maria-sama, did you know? There's a ghost story about Beatrice that's been passed down among the servants. Ooh? 
Uh, yeah, that's right. Shannon, tell us about it. I don't really know, but it's apparently pretty famous among the servants. What's this? A ghost story? Yes. It seems it's a story from before we were born. I also heard about it from my mother. Yes, it has been passed down since the time of the mansion's construction. The servants of that time whispered that the mansion had two masters, one of the day and one of the night. The tale that Shannon told was just like a typical campfire ghost story. If there was a forest with a witch living inside it, then of course the witch would come pay the mansion a visit from time to time. At some point, this ghost story naturally sprouted up between the servants. When people do the rounds a second time to check doors, windows and locks that were supposedly closed, they find some of them left open. Lights that were supposed to be turned off to be off were turned on, and lights that were supposed to be on went out. Things left lying around would disappear, and things would appear when no one had any memory of putting them there. When any of these things happened, the old servants would say that the witch had visited the mansion, invisible, and was playing pranks. Ooh, see, she exists. Beatrice exists. Yeah, she exists. Long ago, it was always right before leaving for school that I wasn't able to find my bag and stuff. Maria puffed out her chest with an ooh ooh, as though this was final proof of the witch's existence. If I opened my mouth, Maria would probably be hurt again, so I didn't. I mean, you hear this kind of story everywhere. Depending on the place, they might blame it on a dwarf or an elf. The only difference is that they call it a witch on this island. Of course, walking around a vast, elegant mansion at night would be a little unsettling. It's an island devoid of people. Since the mansion is so drafty, walking around on the night of a thunderstorm would certainly be eerie. In addition, some servants have also seen will-o'-the-wisps and glittering butterflies dancing around. Kanon-kun also saw something like that when he went patrolling one night. And recently, you often hear servants talking about strange footsteps heard inside the mansion near midnight. We've whispered together that the Beatrice Sama in the portrait sometimes makes herself invisible and walks through the mansion. It happened a while ago, but even I have heard footsteps while patrolling at night that resemble these stories. <laughs> That's scary. Ah, but there's nothing to be afraid of. Beatrice Sama is another ruler of this mansion, separate from the master. The master. So there's no need to be unnaturally afraid. If you respect her, I hear she won't do anything bad. However, she can be quite terrifying if you don't respect her, right? Correct. I've heard that just before I began working here. Someone who spoke badly about Beatrice Emma fell down the stairs and quit after receiving a large in injury to their back. Because of that, there is a rumor between the servants that Beatrice's, Beatrice Sama's anger had been brought down upon this person. Ugh. Anger will definitely be brought down on Battler and Jessica. Ugh. Uh, I'm sorry. I don't want her anger brought down upon me. I apologize, Maria. Of course, I also apologize to the witch. I'm sorry, Beatrice, Beatrice Sama. Please forgive an outsider's nonsense. I'll apologize as well. I'm sorry, Beatrice Sama. Will the witch be able to forgive us now? Ooh, don't know. Witches are fickle, so they forgive when they want to, and don't when they don't. Ooh. Well, that's no good. Maria Chun, isn't there some kind of good luck charm that could prevent Battler Kun and Jessica Chun from suffering Beatrice Sama's wrath? Maybe something that can block against magic. By relying on Maria, who was proud of knowing the most about witches, George was trying to revive her self-esteem. Once again, I've got to admire his ability to calm the kids down. 
After taking a moment to cross her arms and seriously ponder whether there might be a charm that could save us, she started flipping through the pages in her notebook. I thought it was just a scribbled diary, but there also seemed to be quite a few pages that looked like they come from a book on black magic. Maria solemnly considered a group of these pages, which contained things that looked like magic circles. Apparently, Grandfather wasn't, wasn't the only one with a, black, with a black magic hobby. When Maria finally found what she was looking for, she snapped the notebooks shut and threw it into her handbag. She then began fishing through the bag's contents. There seemed to be various jumbled up things in there. After a while, she took out various pieces of junk, although they were probably important magical items to Maria, and repeatedly threw them back in, saying they were wrong. It was all a little humorous, just like when Doraemon took out the wrong tool. Finally, she seemed to discover what she was looking for. With a face that was unimaginably cheery when compared to the intense expression she had worn until now, she held those out to Jessica and me. Ooh. I grabbed it and saw that it was a very cheap looking charm. It looked like a bracelet made from a plastic rosary with a scorpion themed metal attached. Hey Kit, haven't you ever seen those cheap zodiac themed accessories? The kind you might win in a crane game at an arcade. It really looked like something like that. You've been trying to chat for 20 minutes? Holy sh... <laughs> you know, Fleece also mentioned that she was having trouble, so I imagine that Twitch is just having a big old breakdown at the moment. So that's sad. Oh. Well, it, I guess it unmelted. Hey, Llama. How are you doing? Um, do y'all need a recap? Because we're just talking about witches over here. <laughs> well, uh, well, now you could hypothetically also, uh, I appreciate you being here, all of you. Uh, but in that case, I'm going to keep reading, and uh, if there's anything you did miss or anything that isn't clear, just feel free to ask. Uh, I am going to take... <laughs> Automa did not like that one. It actually highlighted the term Twitch. So you're not like it, it mods it if you try to insult Twitch, basically. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, it's a it says add permitted term Twitch, bitch baby. <laughs> This is the funniest. I'm screenshotting that. Wow. Also, uh, good night, Llama. Thank you for dropping by. And have a good day tomorrow. Also, thank you for the gift that is Twitch Bitch Baby, because that's very fucking funny. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, okay, so back to the scorpion charm it really looked like something like that there were two of them probably one for me and one for jessica however the very fact that there were two of them made them feel even more cheap more like cheap manufactured goods making it pretty hard to think of them as magical items you giving me t these to me in battle Ooh, with these charms you don't even need to worry about beatrice because scorpions have the power to ward off magic. Uh, really? Didn't know scorpions could do that. Ooh, Battler doesn't believe. Ooh. I'd said too much and angered Maria again. Maria took out her notebook again, 
pointing out various pages as she went on and on about how the scorpion had such incredible holy power that it had been used in ancient in magic repelling magical circles since ancient times ah i've heard about that from some of the other young servants something about how the scorpion is drawn as a magic repelling symbol in sorcery oh really Ooh. The scorpion protects against bad magic and calamity, and emerald brings peace to the heart. Therefore, its effects are twofold. Ooh. It's true. The scorpion wraps around the emerald and protects it. Yes, that certainly does sound like it'd work well. I really wanted to make fun of those worthless looking charms, but as I watched Maria explaining with all of her heart, and realized that she'd found them for our sakes, I started to feel like it might actually work, even if it was just a prize from some game center. The material quality of the charm didn't matter. What mattered was the strength of her feelings. Even I don't think of myself as the sort of, as the sort of loser who would laugh at something like that. Okay, thank you. I apologize to Beatrice-sama, but even if I do end up getting cursed, I'll be safe now. Thanks to Maria's charm. Right, Jessica? Yeah, that's right. Thanks, Maria. Ooh. Wear it on your arm when you want your heart to be at peace. Put it in your wallet and your money won't decrease. If you hang it from a no doorknob, bad things can get in. It's a really convenient charm. What an incredible effect. If Maria-sama gives it her confident seal of approval, then it must surely be reliable. Shannon-chan clapped her hands together, and Maria stuck out her chest. She was totally in a good mood again. It's probably best if we let her lead the conversation a bit longer, if it'll keep her in such a good mood. Come to think of it, she looked a bit bored when we were getting excited about the, about the hidden goal, probably because she couldn't keep up. While eating the cookies Kumasawa-san had baked, Jessica and I asked Maria this and that about black magic. Maria chat happily chatted away in response to our questions. Each time, George, Aniki, and Chanachan would act surprised or chime in. The clouds in the sky grew darker and darker, but we cousins really enjoyed communicating freely after a year of separation. Did I just feel a drop on my forehead? Huh? I wonder. As George Aniki rubbed his forehead, he looked up at the sky. Considering the color of the sky and the dampness of the air, it wouldn't have been odd for a raindrop to hit him. The wind also seemed to have grown a bit stronger. Ooh? I didn't feel a drop. Only I didn't. Ooh. Don't worry, neither did I. Anyway, I'm sure it'll rain so much tonight that everyone will get to feel plenty of raindrops. That's right. Maybe we should head back soon. Shannon Chan looked, her, looked down at her watch. It was probably well into the evening by now. Is it already time for you to return to your work? Yes. Thank you very much for allowing me to enjoy some time together with you all. Tell Kumasawa-san thanks for the cookies. Okay, everyone, help out with the cleanup. Shannon-chan declined our help, saying this, that this was a servant's job. But picking up a dropped fork before the waitress has to is like my purpose in life. We folded up the blanket, gathered up the trash, and helped clean everything up. Ooh, trash is getting away, ooh. I won't let it escape. I'll grab it before Maria does. Ooh, I'll grab it. Ooh. Maria, don't get your shoes wet. You'll get in trouble. To Maria, chasing after some trash scent flying by the powerful winds was just another game. But by the time he finished, the wind was blowing pretty strongly. Probably a good time to head back. You've all helped me out a lot. Thank you very much. It looks like you're really out of time. It's okay if you head back first. 
George Aniki perceived her hurried appearance, that very little from her hurried appearance, that very little of her free time was left. Genji sounds very strict about time. If you if you don't show up where you're supposed to be at the right time, I bet he'll be pissed. We'll see you later. Do your best with your work. Yes. Then, if you'll excuse me. After making a respectful bow, Shen Chan ran towards the rose garden. Okay, let's head back to the guest house. We can watch TV or something and relax a little. Ooh, want to watch TV? Want to watch TV? Ooh. Then it's decided. Let's all head back and watch TV together. Maria, who wasn't done having fun, agreed once television was mentioned. We climbed up the gentle stairs and returned to the rose garden. The wind had grown very strong, and roses shook throughout the garden like ripples on the water. This might be our last chance to see these beautiful roses. I'll bet tonight's typhoon ruins them. These roses might be done in by tonight's winds. You're right. Still, I think the roses were pretty lucky. After all, they got to welcome all of you before the typhoon. All flowers lose their petals eventually. But that means we can admire them even more when they're in bloom. That's right. Maria, burn this image into your eyes. At this moment, they're the best roses of the year. Ooh, burned into eyes. Right then, Maria suddenly clapped her hands. It looked like she'd remembered something. My rose, the typhoon will send it flying. Ooh. Oh, you mean that sad-looking rose George Aniki marked with a ribbon? Maria apparently remembered where the rose was. She ran at full speed. The rest of us followed her. Ooh. Ooh. Where was that again? I'm sure it was around here somewhere. We searched everywhere around that area, but it was only a single flower among all of these roses after all. Even though we knew it was somewhere close by, we weren't able to find it. The winds making up the typhoon's front lines made roses throughout the made roses throughout the garden undulate. It was almost like it was teasing us by making the location of Maria's rose impossible to find. M maybe it wasn't here. Let's try spreading out a bit in our search. Sounds good. Let's go for strength in numbers. Hmm? What's up, Maria? As we made to split up and search, Maria tugged on my jacket with an unhappy face. You could tell that she didn't want us to leave that spot. What is it? What's wrong? Uh, my rose is here. It's here. But it's actually not, right? Maybe it was on the other side of the flower bed. If we all look, we'll find it fast, okay? Ooh, it's here. My rose is here. Look for it. Look for it. Ooh. Maria stomped her feet in irritation. She pointed at that spot and said it was definitely there, but in actuality it wasn't. Even so, Maria got mad when we said we were going to search elsewhere. We were at a loss for what to do. For a while we had to stay near Maria and pretend to search through that rose thicket. Ooh, ooh, not here, not here. Not here. Ooh. Maybe she's saying that it should be there, but it isn't. Maria became increasingly irritated. Oh man, Maria's le really losing her temper. Sometimes Maria starts to really care about pointless stuff. If she gets what she wants, that's okay, but... You can't find something that isn't there. That's not good. Just when we were at a loss of what to do, Maria called out in a loud voice. Mama! Ooh. We could see Aunt Rose in the direction Maria was waving her hand. 
Maybe she wanted to look at the garden one more time before the typhoon came. Or maybe she had some business at the guest house. Aunt Rosa was coming from the mansion. She quickly noticed her daughter's voice and came over. Sorry about that. My, my, what happened, everyone? Are you looking for something? Look for it. Mama, you look for my rose, too. Ooh. Your rose? We found an unhealthy rose around here and marked it. We tied a we tied a candy wrapper around it, but Maria, if I remember correctly, it was growing right in front and really stood out, didn't it? Unless it grew legs and ran off somewhere, it must have been somewhere else. Maybe you remember it wrong. Ooh, it is here. It is here. Valor doesn't believe. Ooh. How many times do I have to tell you to stop saying ooh ooh before you understand? Mama would look for it, so stay quiet. I'd never seen Aunt Rosa be anything other than kind and gentle, so her anger surprised me a bit. Aunt Rosa began searching as well, so we went along with her for the time being. But we were already more than sure it wasn't around here. So it didn't take long for Aunt Rosa to realize that too. The rose isn't here. Did you mistake this place for somewhere else? There are so many roses around. Ooh, ooh, that's wrong. It is here. Mama doesn't believe. Ooh. I already believed you and looked hard for it, didn't I? But it isn't here. Ooh, but it is here. It is here, but it isn't. Ooh. Then someone must have ripped it out. Anyway, stop saying ooh. Ooh. Who ripped out my rose? Who did? Give it back. Give it back. Ooh, ooh. How should I know? Stop. Stop it. Stop saying ooh, ooh. Aunt Rosa slapped Maria's red left cheek with her palm. In that instant, Maria was shocked into silence. Of course, it was only for an instant. When Maria realized that her wish was being rejected, she started yelling even louder. Ooh, ooh, my rose, my rose, ooh. Didn't I tell you to stop that weird habit? That's why all the kids in your class make fun of you. Cut it out. Once again, her palm slapped Maria's cheek. This time she didn't go silent. She choked as she started crying and began to bawl in an increasingly loud voice. Aunt Rosa was clearly irritated and lifted her hand once more to try and shut her daughter up. Uh, Aunt Rosa, now now, she's just a little kid. There's no reason to get so serious. I tried to cut in with a bitter smile, rubbing my hands together. But Aunt Rosa glared at me with a serious face, and I realized I should have stayed out of this. I'm sorry, but could the rest of you go back to your room for a bit? I need to have a little talk with Maria. Ooh, nobody believes in my rose, even though it was here. Ooh, look for it. Look for it. Here, it was here. Ooh. But it's not here. So you must have confused this place for someone else, right? Ooh, it is here. It's definitely here. Ooh. Then it disappeared. Give it up. Why? Why did it disappear? Why? Why? Ooh. I don't know that. So stop saying ooh. Aunt Rosa once, once again raised her hand, overcome by emotion, and slapped Maria's cheek. It was strong enough to knock Maria over. Hey, Aunt Rosa, even if she is your daughter, violence isn't the answer. I stepped between them to protect Maria who was still on the ground, crying, ooh, ooh. I knew that, as an outsider, problems between parent and child were none of my business. But I wasn't brought up to just silently observe something like this. Don't you think it's weird, Badlerkun? Are there any girls at your school who matter ooh, ooh? Well, I am in high school, 
but for an elementary school, I think saying ooh, ooh is pretty cute. Cute? Saying ooh is cute? Cute? My careless words seem to have earned me Aunt Rosa's wrath. She grabbed my collar with a terrifying expression. Don't say such nonsense. Do you know how old Maria is? She's nine. She's a fourth grader, not a kindergartner. But she still makes that sound during class. Don't you get it? Do you know what they say about this kid when they bully her? Thanks to this weird habit, she still hasn't made a single friend. Don't turn your eyes from reality and carelessly call Maria cute. Think more seriously about this kid's future. Ooh. Ooh. I told you, stop making that sound. Didn't I tell you to stop it? Aunt Rosa stuck, struck Maria's quivering head, from which an increasingly unhappy voice was rising. I tried to stop it, but Aunt Rosa pushed me away. My back hit Jordaniki. A long time ago, Aunt Rosa also thought of it as nothing more than one of Maria Chan's baby words. But now that it hasn't been fixed even midway through elementary school, she's been worrying about it a lot. How she talks isn't really that big of a deal, right? She'll never make it as an adult if she's like that. So even though it isn't fun to watch, this is a problem between parent and child. Well, even I get chewed up by mom all the time because of how I talk. When they put it that way, maybe even a scene as painful as this isn't something an outsider like me should put in on. Battler Kun, when you were a kid, didn't you have any bad habits that you couldn't fix and that got you into trouble? Well, one or two. On Parents' Day once, I kept getting yelled at in front of everyone, and it was embarrassing as all hell. Well then, you can understand how the two of them must feel right now. I'm sure they don't want us to be here now. You understand too, don't you, Jessica Chun? I don't think anyone likes to be seen when they're being scolded. Let's go. We'll return to the guest house. Then, after Maria Chan comes back, let's welcome her as if nothing happened. That's probably for the best, isn't it? We thought George Anneke's point was probably a reasonable one, and we may have been eager to use that reasonable-sounding argument as a justification to retreat from this heart-mending scene. Jessica and I nodded at George Anneke, and we all left. We called towards Maria, telling her that we were going to head to the guest house, but she didn't seem to hear, and we felt sort of guilty and shameless after saying it. In that case, look by yourself as much as you want. Mama doesn't care. Ooh, I'll look for it. I'll look for it by myself, even if Mama doesn't care. Ooh, have it your way. After blasting her with those last few words, Rosa spun on her heels and quickly returned to the mansion. Maria probably viewed that as a cold gesture, meant to injure, but that wasn't Rosa's intention. It was because the hand with which she had so emotionally struck Maria's cheek was still numb. It was because, if she stayed there screaming, she might again be taken over by her emotions and continued slapping her daughter's cheek over and over. After Rosa left, Maria was left alone in the rose garden. The wind began to blow stronger and stronger, and every once in a while, a raindrop would fall on her forehead. However, Maria couldn't leave that place, not until she found that poor, wilting rose. It had definitely been there. Even so, it wasn't. Even though she knew the place, and even though it had been there, it wasn't. Maria bitterly stared at the place it was supposed to be and thought frantically. Maybe the angle I'm looking from is wrong. Maybe the height I'm looking from is wrong. While gazing at a single point, Maria repeatedly stood up, changed her position, and continued to stare. The wind was getting stronger and stronger, but Maria kept on looking for that rose in front of the flower bed.
Kinzo noticed the sound of the raindrops beating on the window. It seemed to be pouring down thickly. It had begun to rain later than the weather report had, re had predicted. Blech. Kinzo approached the window as if being summoned by the sound of the rain. The sound of rain is a sound of silence. That sound feels, that sound feels quieter than any silence and makes humans remember that, in the end, they are alone from the moment they're born to the moment they die. You're late, Beatrice. Were those words directed at the rainy sky? There was no one to be seen in the direction of Kinzo's gaze. Well then, let us begin. Let us begin our banquet of miracles. This island has now been cut off from the world. Now there are none who can interrupt my ceremony. There are many fitting sacrifices for you. Four of my children, three of their companions, four of my grandchildren, me and my guests and my servants. You may devour as many as you please. The key of fate will select the sacrifices in accordance with the demon's roulette. If that roulette chooses me, even I will become your sacrifice. However, because of that, because I will bet on such madness, I will most assuredly bring forth a grand miracle. Come, devour to your heart's content. I will achieve victory over that roulette. Yes, I'll put everything on the line. First, I will return the inheritance of the Ushiromiya family. Accept it! Kinzo tore the window open, ripped a golden ring off his finger, and forcefully threw it away. At that time, the sound of thunder rang out, giving the illusion that the lightning had accepted the ring. And when you are resurrected, Surely I will be the one who stands witness. I will survive until the end and watch over you as you awaken. So come, Beatrice, welcome to my banquet. In exchange for all that I have created, show me another miracle just this once. Ah. Oh. Beatrice. Okay, uh, I think that's a good place to take a quick break. So I'm gonna do that. You know, I gotta get some water and stuff, and yeah, beer beat. ticker popped up on top of the TV program we were watching. The disaster report told how municipalities all over were continually sending out rain, flood, and wave warnings. Of course, the raindrops beating harshly on the window were even more convincing. This rain's incredible. Still, when it's raining this hard, it also feels like it might stop at any moment. You wish. They said the typhoon's moving slow, so it might be like this all day tomorrow. And even a little bad weather stops the boats from coming. It looks like we won't be able to head out on Sunday after all. Just in case I cleared all outside business for my Monday schedule, and I'm glad I did. Which means <laughs> it looks like we'll get to skip school on Monday. Living on an island started to sound pretty good. 
Come to think of it, Jessica, you've got to take a boat to school every day, don't you? What do you do when the boat stops running? Do you stay home when it rains and show up late when the wind's blowing like King Kamehameha? If the boats don't come, they stay home. Still, it's not as good as it sounds. Usually I'm ordered to study by myself, and it's not that fun with someone standing right behind you watching everything you do. During the rainy season, does the weather ever stay bad for a long time and make you miss a bunch of days in a row? That does happen sometimes. Still, I get a call from my homeroom teacher every single day, who'd sour sourly guide me on how I should teach myself and what I had to turn in. She can't skip school as easily as, you, as, easily as you're imagining, Battlekun. She's got to follow the rules for people that travel to school by boat and get a good amount of studying done. It'd actually be easier to just go to school. In my own room, I get distracted and can't concentrate. After being made to do nothing but workbooks for several days straight, it's pretty hard to handle all that mental stress. When I get into college, I really just want to go to some dorm and quickly say goodbye to this inconvenient island. Ah, okay. By the way, what do you do when the weather's good in the morning, but then gets so bad on your way home that the boats are closed? Do you spend the night at school? That actually happens a lot. Because of that, they've built some lodgings there for people who can't get back to the island they live on. That's where you'd spend the night. Sometimes when it gets really bad, you can't get back home for a few days at a time. Someone commuting to school or work on a train packed to twice its capacity might carelessly think that commuting by boat would be pretty interesting and fun. But it sounds like it, sounds like it comes with troubles on its own. Of its own. Weird. Some of these sentences are really hard to say out loud. You hear thoughtless tourists saying stuff like that all the time. I've had enough of violent life. I really want to just graduate high school and say goodbye to this island. But there are all dorm schools even for high school, right? Why'd you choose that Nijima school of all places? I have wanted to go to one of those from the beginning. But mom's always going on about how I need to learn manners and discipline as the successor. So I ended up sticking up, sticking close to home even for high school. Man, I hate this island. I just want to go live in a city. I don't care if rain or even spears fall from the sky as long as I can move to a city where I can wear casual clothes and sandals. I can get to a convenience store in less than five minutes. <laughs> Hold out just a little longer. Just a bit more and you'll graduate high school, right? I can't wait a little longer. Uh. Jessica stretched out and reclined in the sofa. Maybe it was a bad time slot because there weren't any interesting programs on, and we had nothing to do but languidly kill time until we were called for dinner. After that episode, Maria never turned to the cousin's room after all. Aunt Rosa probably took her back to the mansion. It had to be pretty boring for Maria, all by herself, while the adults had a confusing conversation. We thought we might as well head over to the mansion to see her, but the weather really was awful. And since there wasn't much time until dinner, we stayed where we were. At that time, we heard the sound of a humble knock. Jessica entered. Yes! The preparations for dinner are complete. Please come to the mansion. It was Kanan-kun's voice. Did he go to all the trouble of coming from the mansion in the spring just to get us? Couldn't he have just called us on the telephone? Well, I guess servants at work don't always get to take the most efficient route. Just when I was getting hungry. Let's go. George Aniki turned off the television and stood up. My stomach's been growling for a while. I've always been a huge fan of the main family's dinners. And didn't Goda-san say it was calf steak or something? Ooh, I can't wait. Our dinners are always even more fabulous than usual when the family conference comes around. Even I'm looking forward to it. Let's go, let's go. As we left the room, Kanokun bowed silently and respectfully. Okay, let's go. Is the rain pretty nasty out there? Yes. 
take care not to get your garments wet. After seeing the three of us out, Kano couldn't peer into the empty room. Wasn't Maria Sama with you? Uh, no, she's not. Wasn't she with Aunt Rosa? Rosa was lying on a sofa in the empty parlor, having fallen asleep before she knew it. She was bearing a burden that the children couldn't even imagine. That's why she only needed to let her guard down a little before the weariness immediately dragged her into the world of sleep. Realizing this, Genji brought a blanket over to her. When he tried to spread it over her, her eyes snapped open, as though she'd been shocked with electricity. Ah! Thank you, Genji-san. But she realized that the thing that had touched her was just a blanket, and that Genji had been considerately giving it to her, she let out a sigh of relief. Did I wake you? My sincere apologies. No, it's okay. I hadn't planned on sleeping in the first place. What time is it now? When he was asked for the time, Genji checked the pocket watch that he took out of his chest pocket. It is slightly after six. Rosa gave her head a little shake when she realized that not much time had actually passed, even though it had felt like she'd slept for ages. Even though she didn't feel rested at all, the drowsiness that had enveloped her must have been pretty deep. Thank you. I'll be fine without the blanket. I mustn't sleep at such a, such a strange time. My sense of time has been completely thrown off. The rain has finally started pouring down in earnest, hasn't it? Rosa finally realized that the peaceful sound that had put her to sleep was actually the rain. The wind's blowing hard, too. I wonder if the typhoon's finally here. That's what they said on TV. The typhoon is moving slowly, so they think it will be like this all day tomorrow. Really? So our last chance to see that wonderful rose garden must have already passed by. From the window, what she could see of the rose garden was completely blurred by the wind and the, and the rain. Maria. That's right. What about Maria? I have not seen her. Did she not return to the guest house? Rosa knew her daughter's nature well, so a chill ran down her spine. Maria was stubbornly honest and if she was ordered to find something that didn't exist, she would look forever and ever, even in pouring rain. No, the cousins left before I did, so Maria was alone. Unless someone told her to stop, she'd stay there even if, if it started raining spears. Without even opening an umbrella. Uh, how could I have lost control of my emotions and done such a thing? Even though she'd known about Maria's simple honestly, honesty better than anyone, she'd once again lost control of her emotions and done something terrible. Maria! Rosa pushed Genji away and ran down the hall. The outside really looked like a typhoon, and the rain was pouring down spectacularly. Maybe because of some aspect of the terrain, the winds were in typhoon class, so an umbrella wouldn't be torn out of one's hands. Even so, it certainly was a windy, windy rain. There was no time to admire the roses being drenched. Anyway, I'm getting pretty worried about Maria. You don't think she's still rebelliously searching for that rose alone, do you? I wonder. Surely she wouldn't do it in this rain. Or at least I could believe, I wish I could believe that, but Maria Chan sometimes gets really stubborn and intensely straightforward. We hadn't worried much, thinking that Aunt Rose had taken her back to the mansion. However, when Kanon could have come from the mansion to call us and thought Maria was here, we got a little worried. I did not see her in the mansion, so I was sure she was here. After all, Rosa Sama was taking a nap. You didn't see her on your way over here? My apologies. 
I opened my umbrella and ran as fast as I could, so I did not pay much attention. If he had cut through the rose garden, taking the shortest line between the mansion and the guest house, then he would have just barely missed the place where Maria had been looking for her rose. And it was raining this hard too. It certainly would have been possible for Kanonkun to fail to notice her. Instead of arguing around here, it, it'd be faster to just check it out directly. Aniki, why don't we race over there? Oh, do you think you can beat me now that you've been growing for six years? Okay, let's settle this. Go. George Aniki and I flew out into the ring. Jessica and Kan Kanonkun followed us. Maria! If you're there, answer me. Maria! It's Aunt Rosa. Hey, Aunt Rosa! When George Aniki called back, Aunt Rosa jumped at him and grabbed onto him. Where's Maria? Is she, isn't she with you? No, we didn't meet with Maria John after that. Maria! Six years ago, Maria was three years old. She was a cute and pure kid who would just accept whatever anyone said. But six years have passed since then. She's nine now, and experiencing the ups and downs of life should have, should have taught her something. But Maria, are you telling me you're still as innocent and pure as you used to be? Maria! As I circled the rose bed, something white unexpectedly turned to face me. It was a white umbrella. Maria was crouching down, holding a white umbrella, still searching for that rose. Ugh. Her face, which had turned bright red from, from her crying her eyes out, was dirtied with water and mud. It was a truly pitiful sight. Maria, are you still looking? Ugh. Can't find it. Can't find my rose. Ugh. Maria had probably been here since the rain started pouring down. Her shoulders were freezing. She looked tired to the bone, but fortunately, since, since she was holding an umbrella, she wasn't completely soaked. The umbrella probably came from the handbag Maria was always carried around. Thank goodness. Seriously, thank goodness. Battlekun, thank goodness you found her. Maria! I'm sorry, I'm so sorry. Aunt Rosa threw her umbrella aside and hugged Maria. Ooh, it's not here. My rose isn't here. Ooh. I'll look for it with you later, okay? So just put it on hold for today, okay? Ooh. Put it on hold for today. It looked like Maria still wasn't able to accept it. She no longer had enough energy left to resist. Jessica and Kanonkun caught up with us. I'll have a towel ready in the, in the mansion immediately. Maria, were you here this whole time? I'm sorry. I'm sorry for being such a bad mother. Aunt Rosa, why don't we head back to the mansion for the time being? If we stay here, Maria will catch a cold. You're right. Maria, let's go. If we don't get you cleaned up, Grandfather will be mad. Ooh, hungry. It's already time to eat. You did a good job holding out, Maria. Once the weather gets better, we'll all go search together. We couldn't stay in the rain forever. We took Maria with us as we had it back into the mansion. Maria apparently wasn't as worn out as I thought. When she remembered we were having calf steak for dinner, she started chanting, I'm hungry, I'm hungry, ooh, ooh, and returned to her usual spirit itself. Aunt Rosa didn't chide Maria for saying, ooh, ooh. I see. So she had an umbrella on her. Maria sure is good at packing the right stuff. Ooh. I didn't bring an umbrella. Ooh. What? Then how did you get that white umbrella you're holding? Ooh, I borrowed it. Some caring person must have brought her an umbrella. 
A normal kid would look for shelter once it started raining. But Maria was too stubborn to give up so easily. So maybe that caring person gave up on telling Maria to find shelter, then decided to at least give her, give her an umbrella. I see. I'll have to thank that person. Who was it? Ooh, Beatrice. The name Maria cheerfully mentioned was that of the island's witch. Rosa took a deep breath and asked again, trying to do so in a way that wouldn't damage Maria's good mood. Really, that's wonderful. So, who was it? Who brought you that umbrella? Ooh, Beatrice. Ooh. Maria immediately realized that her mother didn't believe her and started crying out unhappily again. So Rosa stopped pursuing the subject. It'd probably be faster to ask whoever lent Maria the umbrella during dinner rather than ask Maria herself. Father, please at least join us for dinner. It won't be a family conference otherwise. Along with a dull pounding on the door, the sound of Krause's ent entreaty could be heard. However, that voice seemed to be resigned to the fact that nothing it said would be heard. Kinzo-san, won't you at least come out for dinner? All your children have gathered here to see your face, haven't they? Silence, Nanjo. So, the bishop won't work. One move too short. Apparently, Kinzo was completely focused on the final battle of his long-lasting chess match with Nanjo. Kinzo's brow was wrinkled as he continued to glare at the game board through his spectacles. Krause's voice didn't reach his ears. Kinzo-san, I'm hungry myself. Why don't we go down and eat? Go by yourself if that's what you want. Let me consider this next move for a little longer. We are going to finish it tonight. Otherwise, it's doubtful we'll finish before the world ends. Nanjo rose from his seat, hoping this would prompt Kinzo to do the same, but Kinzo's eyes never left the chessboard. He knew well that Kinzo always displayed a blind concentration when it came to chess, <laughs> but he'd never seen Kinzo concentrate as hard as this. Hey babe, welcome to the stream. Also kinda yeah. Uh, do, do, do you want like a recap? A lot has happened. It was almost as though Kinzo was telling the truth, and there would never be another chance for them to continue their contest if they didn't finish tonight. It seemed that, no matter how obstinately he called out to Kinzo, it wouldn't reach the latter's heart. Nanjo gave up and headed to the door that Kraus was still banging on. The door to the study opened. Kraus was taken aback, thinking that maybe Kinzo was actually coming out. However, Nanjo was the one who appeared, and Kraus let out a sigh of relief. Dr. Nanjo, is father... I'm sorry I couldn't be of service. Right now, this room is Kinzo-san's whole world. Nanjo shook his head with a completely defeated expression. Kraus raised his fist once more and banged on the door, shouting. Father, can you hear me? We're heading down now, but please join us anytime you feel like it. All of your children are waiting for you. I will now save thank you. The race is on. There's a there's a twenty minute cooldown on that. Just so you know. Krause's voice was very loud, and he was making a racket pounding on the door. There was no way it would reach Kinzo's ears. Well, it certainly was reaching him, but he ignored it anyway. 
However, unlike the time he'd been called down for lunch, he didn't fly into a rage. By now, Kinzo was calm at heart. Almost as though, he's had, as though he had taken on a philosophical view and turned himself over to fate. Neither dinner nor the faces of my children interest me in the slightest. I will only leave here if Beatrice is resurrected, or if I am chosen as a sacrifice for the key. The demon's roulette has already started spinning. What meaning does dinner have at this point? As though the painfully loud banging on the door completely failed to enter his hearing, Kinzo silently thought about his next chess move, still in his philosophical state. Just as always, Kinzo's figure couldn't be seen anywhere in the dining hall. Kraus, wearing a bigger, bitter smile, returned with Nanjo. Father says he is still not feeling well. He truly regrets missing this once-in-a-year opportunity to sit together with his gathered family. Ava and Rudolf sniggered. Given Kinzo's personality, there was no way he'd show signs of regret and none of his relatives showed any regret at his absence. Then, why don't we start dinner? Gota, begin. Certainly. Well then, if you will allow me. When Gota was told to start the family conference dinner, his biggest time to shine of the whole year, he nodded with a broad grin. Um, may I ask who lent Maria an, an umbrella? When Rosa timidly cut through the silence of the dining hall, everyone noticed. An umbrella? What's this about? Um, a short while back, Maria was in the rose garden when it started raining, and she apparently borrowed a white umbrella from someone. I wanted to thank them. It wasn't one of us. After you left, we moved to a whole different we moved to a different room and had a friendly chat that whole time. <laughs> That's right. Even after that, the siblings had a real friendly chat. The word friendly fell awkwardly from Hideyoshi's lips, so even those who hadn't been present could tell the conversation hadn't been a pleasant one. At the very least, it couldn't have been me, Ava, Rudolf, Hideyoshi-san, or Kiryu-san. We were together the whole time, even after Natsuhine-san and Rosa-san left. The whole time until the until the meal until the meal started. That's not even a difficult sentence. Nisan went up to the study with Genji san to call father. At that time, the rest of us went straight to the dining hall. So it wasn't one of us. Couldn't it have been a servant, kind enough to lend an umbrella? So was it you, Gorasan? I have been in the kitchen the whole time preparing. My sincere apologies. Gota looked slightly disappointed about missing this chance to show off. At that time, Shannon and Kumasawa appeared, pushing a serving cart loaded with hors d'oeuvres. Then, what about Kumasawa-san or Shannon-chan? Yes? Has, has something gone wrong? Because Shannon had come in part way, she shrank back mistakenly thinking that the others were searching for the one responsible for some error. Uh, it, it isn't like that. It started to rain when Maria-chan was alone in the rose garden. After that, someone lent her an umbrella. Aunt Rosa said she wanted to thank that person. Ooh, Beatrice. Maria, her mouth a thin line, said the witch's name in a small voice. Aunt Rosa explained the situation one more time. As she did, Kumasawa-san cackled. Oh, it wasn't us. Shen and John and I were preparing the rooms together, so we did not go outside. He, yes, I'm sorry I wasn't able to be of assistance. Preparing the rooms? What do you mean by that? Because of the rain, we thought it would be troublesome for all the guests to return to the guest house. Hey, Cliffy. How are you doing? Oh my god, um... This is, uh... Do you want to recap? To catch up? Because I can do that. 
a lot has happened. We're we're like past the intro, I guess. But the intro took six hours. Okay, so sorry, I just love this game so much. Uh, why am I apologizing for that? That's silly. Uh, this is our protagonist. He's his name is Battler. It's a weird name. His entire family is rich as all hell, uh, supposedly. They own an island, and every year they all meet up uh, for a family conference. Baller's been out of the family for about six years because of a, a fight he had with his dad, Rudolph, who's this guy. Because uh, it's a whole mess. Uh, so he's back after a long time. Uh... His grandfather is, he's been locked up in his room and ranting about a witch named Beatrice this whole time. Then there's a, a portrait in a hallway with Beatrice on it, who is a, a witch, apparently. There's a lot of rumors, rumors floating about her, and the youngest one in the family, Maria, is absolutely 100% convinced that Beatrice, the witch, is real. In the epitaph, that is uh, basically like a little placard next to the portrait of the witch, there's a riddle, and the riddle is supposedly leads to uh, 10 tons of gold. Uh, let's see. Specifically, the riddle mentions uh, sacrifices and killing people. And everybody thinks that it's like a metaphor type of thing. And there was a lot of arguing about money. And that's kind of it, I think. That was a little disjointed, sorry. It's We're getting to a point where there's just a lot of information and all of it's sort of equally important. But uh, the bottom line is rich family members have gotten into family money troubles so there's a lot of arguing our protagonist is kind of out of the loop there's also a witch i think that kind of covers it okay let's go uh i need to click really how thoughtful yes it certainly would be rude to chase us outside in this rain could you could you give it a rest Yes, after receiving the order from Madam Kumasawa-san, Kanam-kun and I started preparing the rooms. Then it became time for dinner, so Genji-sama ordered Kanam-kun to go to the guest house and summon the children. Yes, so did Kanam-san find Maria on the way to the guest house and hand her the umbrella? Ooh, wrong. The person who had actually received the umbrella denied it. Rosa was troubled. All she wanted to do was give a word of thanks to the person who had lent the umbrella, but she couldn't find them. And she thought asking like this with everyone gathered for dinner would work immediately. Then was it you, Natsuhine-san? I'm sorry, after everyone's friendly chat, my headache was so bad that I've been resting in my room. Therefore, I did not go outside. Then who was it? George Kun and the kids? That can't be right. No, it wasn't us. We were watching television in the guest house the whole time. Actually, we thought Maria had just gone back to the mansion with you. Then Kun came and he asked whether Maria was, was with us. That's when we first realized she wasn't in the mansion. I mean, if it were me, I'd have grabbed her hand and pulled her under her roof before giving her an umbrella. Rosa was completely baffled. One by one, the relatives and the servants denied that they had done it. Even though it really wasn't something anyone would need to hide. So, by process of, process of elimination, the number of remaining candidates wasn't large. Of course, it wasn't me. 
the right after it began raining, I visited Kinzo, Kinzo-san's room, and I was playing chess with him until just now. Which means that it also wasn't Grandfather. Wait a sec. Is this starting to get a bit weird? Who's left? Then who was it? Kenji-san? Hmm? Um, wait a second, don't get me wrong. It's not like I'm searching for some culprit or anything. All I want to do is, as a mother, thank the person who gave Maria an umbrella in the middle of the rain. Giving an umbrella to a girl loitering in the rain was something to be praised, not hidden. Despite that, no one raised their hand. Why not? Everyone started whispering about how strange this was getting. Calm down, Rosa. Why don't we just ask the person who was lent the umbrella? That's what everyone had been thinking since the beginning. They were all scratching their heads at why she didn't just ask Maria, who had been given the umbrella. However, Rosa bit her lower lip. After all, she already knew how Maria would answer if asked. Of course. Rudolf, Rudolf Kuhn's here's got it right. Maria Chan, tell your uncle. Who lent you the umbrella? Beatrice! The dining hall was wrapped in silence for an instant, but it was soon interrupted by a burst of laughter. <laughs> I see, so Beatrice, the witch of the forest, felt pity and lent her an umbrella. What a lovely story. Rosa, there you have it. <laughs> Rosa couldn't believe it. Even though she just wanted to say thanks for the umbrella, why did everything have to be so clouded in smoke? Ooh, just like Uncle Krauss said. Maria let me, uh, Beatrice let me borrow it. Maria's the one who's talking right now. Ooh. <laughs> isn't that wonderful? We should all be jealous of such purity. What do you think, everyone? Krauss was laughing with a face that was clearly mocking. But Maria was overjoyed, apparently convinced that her claim was being believed. How did that work? Does that mean a witch really appeared and lent her an umbrella? Jessica asked me in a small voice that wouldn't carry over to Maria, who was sitting across from me. Has Maria ever been the type to make jokes? If we'd heard that kind of story pop out of my old bastard's mouth, they would have just taken it as another joke. However, it was hard to explain it away like that when Maria said it. This was getting pretty unnerving. No way. She's always been frank and serious. She's the sort who'd believe any joke, even normal, even ones normal people could instantly tell were lies. I've never even heard of her cracking a joke. Aunt Rosa probably knew that better than anyone. It appeared that because of this weird situation, she had no idea what was going on anymore. So if Maria says she borrowed an umbrella from Beatrice, that must mean it really was Beatrice? We're talking about Maria here, so I can't think of it as some kind of metaphor or joke. It might be best to take what she says at face value. Th th then what's going on? Are you saying Genji-san or someone put on that fancy dress from the portrait and gave Maria the umbrella? I'm, I'm not sure about that. Actually, that's what I want to know. Jessica shrugged jokingly, but her expression didn't completely match her attitude. Once the hors d'oeuvres were set out, and Gota showed off his vast store of knowledge, the meal began. A couple casual chats broke out here and there, but they seemed somehow distant, and the meal ended up being so quiet that you couldn't ignore the sound of the rain sneaking into the dining hall. Kumasawa and Shannon, pushing the serving cart, ran into Genji and Kamen on, on their way to the kitchen. Oh, it's Genji-san. Did you lend Maria-san an umbrella? An umbrella? What are you talking about? Well, I heard that when it started raining, Maria-sama was alone in the rose garden. It seems she borrowed an umbrella from someone there, but we don't know who it was. It wasn't me. After all, I actually thought Maria-sama was in the guest house. When Battler-sama first found her, 
She was already holding a white umbrella. My apologies, but it was not me either. Then could it actually be the master? Both in the dining hall and right here, everyone had stated they hadn't done it. That left only Kinzo, but... Maybe he went walking down the corridor for some reason, when he just happened to see Maria-sama in the rose garden without even an umbrella. The master is not particularly fond of Maria-sama. I agree. I can't imagine that for Maria-sama's sake he'd go to all the trouble of descending the stairs with an umbrella. Oh my, how troublesome. Does that mean the one who lent Maria-sama an umbrella was really Beatrice-sama? <laughs> Kumisawa laughed, just like the relatives in the dining hall who had laughed it off. She couldn't think of any other way to break through the smoke failing the current situation. Just then, the crisp sound of hands clapping twice rang through the hallway. They all turned around at once to see Gota coming out of the dining hall. Okay, everyone. When serving at dinner, proper timing while setting the table is essential. Please immediately see to setting out the soup. Genji-san, the women are in the, in the middle of an important job, so please don't get in their way. Kanon glared at Gota for being rude to Genji, a person Kanon respected. Genji, realizing this, patted Kanon once on the shoulder as a warning. Kanon reluctantly turned away and returned his expression to normal. Obey Goda's instructions. Hurry and prepare the dinner table. Come now, there's no time. Don't dawdle. Hurry. Goda grabbed the serving cart from Shannon and steadily pushed it towards the kitchen. Then please allow us to return to the kitchen. After all, Goda-san's temper is very short. <laughs> Please excuse me as well. Kumasawa and Shannon left. Only Genji and Kanon remained. Through the window, the darkest darkness of the rainy night could be seen, along with the occasional thunderbolt. Genji-sama, did Beatrice-sama really return? I don't know. Shall I inform the master? That is not necessary. If she truly has returned, she will eventually appear before the master of her own accord. Furthermore, she is a fickle person. It would be pointless to report to the master only to find that she does not appear. I wonder if this means the master ceremony has already begun. Probably. However, that has nothing to do with furniture like us. We must continue to return the favor we received from the master until our final moments. Yes, that is furniture's duty. The thunder crashed once more. Except for those instants when lighting up, lightning lit up the sky, nothing could be seen out the window but the darkness of night. Just as humans rule when the sun is up, those that are not human rule when the sun is down. The darkness of night that now surrounded the Rokanjima was ruled by another master, not the Ushiromiya family. Did this master take pity on Maria when she was alone and being pummeled by the rain in the rose garden, lending her, her an umbrella? Kanon looked at the rose garden's lights, dimly visible beyond the window. The dim lights weren't enough to illuminate the surrounding area. Looking at those lights felt like making eye contact with the wish, and Kanon forced himself to avert his gaze. If he didn't, it felt like his eyes would be absorbed by that light. Can the weather change how people act? You often hear stories about how things like atmospheric pressure can influence people's moods and physical health. For some time now, Everyone had been struggling to clear the gloomy atmosphere, 
but any conversation was quickly cut off, and in the end, the dining hall was simply filled by the sound of the rain. Dessert was some kind of chocolate cake, accompanied by pear sherbet. Kodasan enthusiastically explained the recipe as soon as this final dish was presented, but I quickly forgot the details. The guest of honor, grandfather, was, apt, was absent. The weather was horrible, and the identity of the one who'd lent Maria an umbrella remained a mystery. When dinner ended, no one felt even one bit refreshed. It was too late now, but I realized painfully that taste wasn't the only important part of a meal. The whole atmosphere was also critical. Gorasan, a supposed conductor of this musical piece called Dinner, did his best to enliven the place, dropping little jokes left and right, but apparently not one of them succeeded. After taking orders for after-dinner coffee, tea, and orange juice, he left for the kitchen. As soon as he disappeared, Uncle Krauss spoke. My, my, what a waste that the dinner Goto worked so hard to create has met with such a gloomy atmosphere. Yes, absolutely. It just feels like nothing would taste good today. Mm -hmm. I'd like to know why you feel that way. Later on, I'll do all I can as your older brother to help cheer you up. Aunt Ava grimaced slightly. I'd already heard she wasn't on good terms with Uncle Krauss, but it was pretty clear now. When I looked around, I noticed that my father and Aunt Rose were also grimacing. Apparently, there was something besides the weather troubling all of them. Both Aunt Ava and my dad aren't looking too happy. Really? I don't think so. I asked Aunt Natsuhi, who was sitting on my right, but she seemed to be in a bad mood as well. She snapped back as if to say she was absolutely not interested. Well, our adult conversation got a little complicated. It isn't something kids like you need to worry about, Fadler Kun. <laughs> isn't that right, Natsuhi-san, kiri san Uncle Hideyoshi laughed as he spoke, but without his usual brightness, so I could vaguely imagine just how complicated their adult conversation had become. On top of that, even Aunt Natsuhi and Kiryu-san, the people he had directed his comment to, ignored him as though they hadn't heard anything. I didn't know what kind of conversation they'd been having while us kids were away, but it reminded me of how Dad said he had stomach cramps when we arrived at the mansion. The family conference might have been a playful reunion to us kids, but it was definitely different for the adults. After Uncle Hideyoshi's comment was ignored by the other adults, and an awkward silence fell over the room, Kiryu-san spoke up. We were talking about how the kids' careers would turn out. Such as what lies in your future, Battler Kun. Will you just drift on to college? Wouldn't that be a little disheartening as a starting line for the long race of life? Hey, wait a sec. Curious son, if you start talking about something like that in the middle of a meal, it won't digest digest well and we'll all end up getting constipated. <laughs> that's right, that's right. We were talking about Battler Quinn and Jessica Chan's careers. You've got to think seriously about the future. Wahaha. <laughs> Hideyoshi heartily agreed, as if they really had been talking about that. But that was probably wrong. Kiryu-san had been obviously trying to change the subject. However... If Kiryu-san had determined that this was the best course of action for now, for now, then she was probably right. Taking this into account, I cast aside my suspicions as to the cause behind Aunt Ava's and Dad's bad moods. I need some water. At long last, the serving cart returned, filled with coffee and tea. Kamasawa-san and Shannon-chan served it to everyone. Gorasan then explained that this concluded tonight's meal. If only the mood had been a bit more cheery, it might have been the best dinner in my life. It was a shame that this best of dinners couldn't have been had under the best of best of conditions. Ooh, George Onichan, is dinner over now? Over? Yes, with this, dinner is finished. Don't be rude. Stay in your seat and calmly drink up. Ooh. 
Maria looked like she was really excited by the occasionally crashing thunder. Maybe she wanted to quickly finish eating and run over to the window. She had been fidgeting for a while, waiting for the meal to end. Some people are afraid of thunder, while others find it interesting. And Maria was apparently one of the latter sort. Therefore, when she heard from Georgianiki that dinner was over, a huge smile broke across her face. She then rose from her seat, took out her handbag, which she set under her seat, never having left it even while she was eating, and began fishing around inside of it. No one seemed particularly concerned by this behavior. What's that? Where did you get it? George was the first to notice it. As he spoke, Badler noticed too. They saw that Maria was now holding a beautiful, western-style envelope. On the front of the envelope, the Ushiromiya family crest, the one-winged eagle, was done in gold leaf. Furthermore, the fact that it was sealed with dark red wax made it clear that this wasn't something Maria could have brought as a prank. Uh, Maria-chan, what is that? It seemed that Natsuhi had also noticed the strangeness of the envelope Maria was holding. Her voice sounded too serious for someone admonish admonishing a small child, so the relatives around us finally noticed too. What happened, Natsuhi san What is that? Maria, where did you pick that up? That envelope has... Kinzo-san's. When Nanjo muttered that, even us kids could understand why everyone seemed to be frozen solid. The envelope that Maria held was one of the Ushiromiya family head's custom-made envelopes for private use. In other words, it could only mean one thing. This envelope contained a message from Kinzo. Hmm. What is an envelope like that doing here? Now that's an interesting thing to come jumping out at us. Just let me have a peek. Ooh. No way, I'll read it. I was told to read it to everyone. Uncle Hideyoshi tried to snatch the envelope out from Maria's hands, but she protected it, as though hugging it and didn't let go. Hideyoshi-san, you can't use force against a child. Maria-chan? Where did you get this envelope? Ooh, I got it from Beatrice when she gave me the umbrella. She told me to read it to everyone after the meal was over. I'm the witch's me, me messenger. Ooh, messenger. Uh, to be clear, the thingies indicate that she's talking in English instead of uh Japanese at the moment. If I recall correctly, that's why it's coming out so weird. <laughs> Just for context. <laughs> the almighty witch of the island sure likes to mess around. Balor tried to joke about it, but no one laughed. I, I wonder what's written inside of it. Maria-chan? Ooh, gonna read it. Ooh. Maria casually opened the envelope. It was sealed only with wax, so she just had to remove the sealing wax to open it. That sealing wax fell onto the desk. Hideyoshi hastily picked it up and stared fixedly at it. He then set it in the center of the table, where Natsuhi, Kiriya, and Nanjo stared at it. Imprinted in the sealing wax was the one-winged eagle, which was the Ushiromiya family crest and also Kinzo's personal crest. It's this is the family head's personal crest. I know it from the letters I have received from Kinzo-san before. Without a doubt, this is his wax seal. But aren't there several things in this mansion bearing that crest? For example, if there was some kind of stamp for wax seals, couldn't someone other than Kinzo-san have used it? No, Kinzo-san would always use a ring on his finger his proof of the Ushiromiya family headship when he sealed the wax. 
The shape and complex design is definitely Kinzo-san's seal. That is not necessarily so. Anyone in the family must have received a letter from father at least once. We can't eliminate the possibility that someone used that wax as a model to create a fake seal and pass themselves off as father. I agree with Aniki. No matter how much the seal resembles dad's, we can't prove that it's the real thing. So it doesn't prove this envelope com came from him. I absolutely agree. I cannot approve of arbitrarily deciding that this letter came from father, based solely on the wax seal. Dr. Nanjo, couldn't you use a bit more discretion with your vague words? I, I apologize. It was not my place to speak. One after another, all of the siblings from Krauss on downwards rejected Nanjo's statement, saying that the envelope Maria held wasn't necessarily from Kinzo. They were afraid. They feared from the bottom of their hearts that Kinzo's intentions were written in there, and that it might be some announcement regarding the inheritance that would be decidedly unfavorable to them. Maria, the person who gave you that envelope was the same person who lent you that umbrella, right? Ooh. I don't know what ooh means. Is it true? Ooh, yes. Ooh. So in other words, the witch, Beatrice, gave Maria Chan all that, that gave that envelope along with the umbrella? Ooh. Maria no nodded forcefully. I agree with my husband. It's a dubious letter handed over by some suspicious person. It isn't even worth reading. There's nothing wrong with just reading it, right? Balor said it to Jessica in a small voice, trying to act tough, but Natsuki heard him clearly and glared at him with threatening eyes. Uh, and then... Uh... Beatrice told you to read it after the meal was over, right, Maria? Ew. It's okay, everyone. This envelope didn't come from Grandfather, but from Beatrice. Regardless of who actually wrote it, why can't we just hear what's inside before we decide? Th th that's right. Even if Father didn't necessarily write it, I'd still like to know what's written inside. Maria-chan, I'm sorry I tried to take it from you by force earlier. I apologize. So, will you read it out loud in front of everyone? Maria, read it. Ugh. As all the relatives stared fiercely at Maria, she spread the letter open with a rustle. Do you think it really did come from Dad? Impossible. Whenever Father has announced something to us in the past, he would always send Genji if he didn't do it directly, correct? I cannot believe that he would use such a joke-like approach. That's right. Maria, a messenger? That definitely doesn't suit father's tastes. Rosa, could this be Maria-chan trying to surprise us by putting on some kind of show? M Maria isn't really a kid who'd be capable of something so thoughtful. Gonna read it. Ugh. The words came out of Maria's mouth, but for some reason, her voice seemed different than usual. Everyone suddenly went silent. Welcome to Rokunjima, members of the Ushiromiya family. I am Beatrice, the alchemist for this family employed by Kinzo-sama himself. Ha, <laughs> that's crazy. Quiet. I have served him for, for many years in accordance with our contract, but on this day, Kinzo-sama has announced the final suspension of that contract. Therefore, I ask that you would acknowledge my resignation from the position of family alchemist from this day forth. How foolish, what nonsense. I can't stand to listen to it. And now, there is one part of the contract that must be explained to all present. I, Beatrice, lent Kinzo-sama a vast quantity of gold under certain terms. One of these terms specifies that all the gold is to be returned to me upon the termination of the contract. Furthermore, 
I am to receive everything of the Ushiromiya family as interest. <laughs> ridiculous. It's ridiculous from the very beginning. So it's basically one of those things, right? Doesn't it sound just like one of those contracts with the devil? The contract has expired, so they've come to collect the interest. Is she trying to grab some retirement money for her old age or something? What a cheeky witch. Badlerkin, now is not the time to joke around. Badler made a face as if to ask, If I can't make fun of this, what can I make fun of? Some of the adults' faces were pale, while others looked dazed. After hearing this, you may feel as though Kinzo-sama has been savagely ruthless. However, Kinzo-sama did append a special clause to the contract so that you would have a chance to preserve your wealth and honor. If, and only if, that special clause is fulfilled, I will lose my rights to the gold and the interest for all eternity. A special clause? What is it? Special clause. Beatrice retains the right to collect the gold and accumulate accumulated interest upon the termination of the contract. However, if someone is able to discover the hidden goal of this contract, Beatrice must abandon these rights for all time. The collection of the interest will proceed shortly, but if any one of you fulfill, fulfills the terms of this special clause, I shall return everything, including the portion that has already been collected. Furthermore, as the first step in this collection of Kinzo-sama's debt, I have taken possession of the Ushirofiya family head's ring, which signifies the passage of the Ushirofiya family headship from one individual to another. I ask that you confirm this for yourselves by examining the imprint on the wax seal. Are they trying to claim that that's the meaning behind this seal? That father would re relinquish his ring is unthinkable. Kraus stared at the sealing wax as if trying to burn a hole through it. Ava and Rudolf were doing the same thing over his shoulder. C come to think of it, when we were playing chess, I did have a strange feeling that something was missing from Kinzo-san's finger. Dr. Nanjo, don't say something so careless just because of a vague memory. We can't prove its auth authenticity here. Only by asking Father directly can we determine whether he really handed over his ring, and whether this letter tells the truth. Th that's right. It's just as Kiri-san says. Do, do you really think Kinzo-san will tell you? After all, that person's thoughts sometimes surpass the bounds of common sense. No matter what happens, it's still nonsense. In the first place, the illusion of gold itself is one of Father's tricks. I've already heard enough talk of that gold from the rest of you. But this is the witch speaking, right? About how the inheritance and all of the assets will be handed over to the one who finds the gold, right? So maybe Beatrice Sama is father's legal advisor, or in charge of his funds. We can't possibly trust some strange person who entrusts such a suspicious paper to a child. Aniki, we need you to be frank with us. Is it possible Dad's assets are being managed by someone you don't know? No, that's impossible. As the family head's representative, I control all of Father's assets. It should be impossible for anyone to do as they please with them without me knowing it. So, this must mean there are some assets you don't control, right, Krasnisan? How foolish, such assets could not possibly exist. Oh, but there is such a thing. An asset of fathers that you don't control? There is no way such a thing could exist. No, it does. It's fathers, no, Beatrice's hidden gold. Let's keep it simple. In short, Dad had some trusted confidant that Aniki doesn't even know about. Furthermore, this person has always been in charge of watching and managing the gold. Or, it could be some eccentric rich person who offered him a loan with rules like a devil's contract. Could it be that this confidant called Beatrice is trying to test which of Kinzo's children is most worthy to be financed by her gold? 
Kitty's question was one that all the siblings wanted answered. Upon reflection, they realized that Kinzo's strange epitaph had hung in the hall beneath the witch's portrait for quite some time. And while it had been long whispered that whoever solved the puzzle would receive everything, no one had ever clearly stated it. It was just something that everyone had hoped might be true. And right here, right now, the thing they'd hoped for had been clearly stated in Beatrice's letter. It clearly specified that everything of the Ushiromiya family would be given to the one who found the gold. Kinzo-sama has already publicly displayed the location of the hidden gold within the epitaph under my portrait. The rules apply equally to all who can read the epitaph. If you discover the gold, I shall return everything to you. Tonight, I ask that you enjoy your battle of wits with Kinzo-sama to the fullest. I sincerely pray that this night will be both intellectual and elegant. Beatrice the Golden Father, I know you can hear me. Please respond. The door to Kinzo's study was being violently, harshly beaten against over and over again like a percussion instrument. The yells coming from the other side belonged to Kraus, Rudolf, and sometimes Eva. It was the siblings who were trying to intrude upon Kinzo's study to question him about the truth behind that mysterious letter. Kinzo was eating. An elegant tablecloth was set over the desk and the fabulous dinner that had adorned the table down in the dining hall was reproduced here. Kinzo continued his meal in silence. Shannon, taking away an empty plate, looked uncomfortably between the door being pounded on and Kinzo's face. Uh, everyone is calling for you, but what should I do? Leave them. God and my meals both hold silences of virtue. Should I silence them? There's no need. It does not even reach my ears. Kinzo enjoyed his food, apparently indifferent. Genji quietly lowered his head and took a single step back. As he did, Kanon, who stood in reserve like a shadow behind and to the side of Genji, opened his mouth. Maria-sama apparently received a letter from Beatrice-sama so I imagine they want to test its authenticity. <laughs> Has she started already then? Come, Beatrice. I have no shortage of coins to be wagered. Shall we enjoy this night to the fullest? I don't think I'll lose. Your smile will be mine for all eternity. If I could see it one more time, I wouldn't regret losing my wealth, my honor, or even my life. Well then, the roulette has begun to spin. Which pocket will the ball fall into? Noir? Rouge? Or house takes all? Come, you may begin, Beatrice. I'll show you the power of miracles once more. The strange letter that the rich had, had entrusted to Maria wipes all memories of dinner from our, mind, our minds. Maria was repeatedly barraged with questions by Aunt Rose and the other parents, and became increasingly ill-tempered when they refused to believe her. If we kids tried to butt in, they'd probably ignore us. Our parents were all stirred up, firing back and forth about the gold and the distribution of the assets and completely forgetting that we were even there. I'd already guessed they'd been talking like this in the shadows, but I hadn't thought they'd be so blunt. It gave all of us kids a considerable shock. From what we could overhear, all the parents wanted more money as soon as possible. Back and forth about grandfather's inheritance, back and forth about the distribu distribution of the gold if it was found, about advanced payments and cash. 
It was so despicable I could barely, hardly bear to watch, even though one of them was my father. It looked like Jessica felt the same way. We left our seats without being asked to and went to hang out somewhere well away from our parents. I get it. Now I totally see why Grandfather hates coming down from meals. I'm so disillusioned with our parents right now. All that talk about money and the inheritance. How can they act like that right out in the open? Well, I'm already completely dis disillusioned with my old bastard. There's no way I could think any worse of him. <laughs> Th that's exactly the same for me. Still, that freaking shocked me. Shocked me to the core. Jessica looked down at the floor, irritated. She was always talking about how bad her parents were, but maybe she hadn't really felt that way deep inside. The depth of Jessica's shock made that clear. You're all minors being supported by your parents, so you might not understand. But getting money is neither a simple nor a pretty thing. I won't try to force you to understand right now, since you're still kids. But even so, I want you to realize that your parents are just doing their best in their own way. Oh great, George Anik has gotten all mature. George Nissan, I know you're working hard as a full-fledged member of society, but does that mean you turn into a shameless, greedy vulture like our parents whenever you start talking about money and assets? If it were only for my own, my own benefit, then no, I wouldn't want to do that. However, when your family and your employees, your subordinates, and their families are all counting on you, there are some times when you must fight. I hate that kind of fight. That back and forth about grandfather's inheritance just makes me want to puke. Jessica pretended to spit violently. That harsh reaction made the depths of her pain very clear. Let's stop talking about this. All this about grandfather's hidden gold, property, and inheritance is our parents' problem, not ours. Why is my text... Ah, oh, there we go. I agree. At the very least, I think children have a duty to be considerate and stay out of their parents' way when they're talking together. <laughs> Sounds pretty boring. Everyone knows the phrase, adults are filthy. But we had now seen that for ourselves, and that really did give us a considerable shock. George Anakey was now pretty much an adult, and had already been disillusioned with my dad, so the shock wasn't that big for us. But Jessica seemed to be taking it hard. Apparently, she'd received a bigger, bigger blow than I thought. She always talks badly about her parents, but it looks like she hadn't changed at all on the inside. Even now, she's still a pure-hearted, delicate person who can't doubt others. I'm sure she respected her parents as much as anyone else does. And then her parents started raging about going, money, money, inheritance, inheritance, my money, right in front of all the other parents and the children. It's no surprise she received such a shock from hearing that. Jessica John, please don't start hating your mother and father. I won't ask you to understand them, but at least don't hate them. I get it, just leave me alone for a bit. Six years ago, I would have kept taunting Jessica, even after she got all dejected. But I guess I really have grown over the last six years. I realized it'd be better to leave Jessica alone right now. Jessica suddenly looked away sulkily and left the parlor. She probably wanted to be alone for a while. I could do nothing but wordlessly watch her back as she left. Come to think of it, I wonder where Maria Chun went. She's probably pounce, pouting in front of the portrait. Maria truly looked up to witches, and she'd expected that coming in direct contact with Beatrice and receiving the letter as proof would surprise everyone and make them happy. However, the adults had doubted its authenticity, thoroughly, thoroughly bombarding Maria with questions and refusing to accept her story. Even for me, it wasn't hard to imagine how much that must have hurt Maria. We couldn't speak to Maria or Jessica. In the end, George, Aniki, and I just abandoned ourselves to the sound of the falling rain and the dark night. I wonder what's happening with that typhoon.
Maybe there's something about it in the news. Jordaniki started to walking over to the corner of the par parlor where the television was. He hadn't called me over, and I really couldn't have cared less where the typhoon was on the sea now. So, without going over to the television, I lo loitered around the window. The wind hasn't picked up that much here, but I wonder if it's horrible over the sea. I did hear about a severe storm warning on the weather report. Ah, Kiryu-san. I take it those big talks between the adults are going smoothly, yeah? She seemed to catch the sarcasm. Kiryu-san shrugged. I wonder if that stomachache of a discussion will continue all night. It's not going to be fun. Well then, please enjoy playing vultures to grandfather's property as much as you'd like. I feel sick. I'll agree with you on that. If I could just slip away like you, I'd do it. Unfortunately, I can't. Even if I'm not allowed to speak. We spouses are pretty rough too. Kiryu-san took a deep breath, smiling bitterly. That's right. They probably wouldn't let Kiryu-san speak, since she only married into the family. Still, as Dad's partner, she had no choice but to stay by his side and support him. She's probably had to bear the full brunt of his, this mental pressure much more than me. I wasn't going to apologize, but realizing that I'd spoken too harshly, I cut the sarcasm for the time being. So, how does it look? Are they still stuck on the topic of the mysterious witch, Beatrice? More or less. Those four siblings are always piling up secret agreements when they come together to discuss the division of grandfather's inheritance. They're saying that some unknown fifth person has appeared and is trying to make things even more complicated. And there's no way that'll make for a peaceful conversation. Just when you think they're snarling at each other, they'll set up a common front. That's so hey, Nason's not the only one getting headaches. On the one hand, they all want a larger portion than the other siblings, so they're all rivals. But on the other hand, they don't want one yen to be snatched up by anyone other than the siblings, so they're also all allies. I hadn't been told the details, but the siblings were apparently discussing how to protect their shares under various situations, setting up ceasefire agreements and rules to prevent anyone from getting an unfair advantage, even preparing to resource a legal action if absolutely necessary. That they, that they would go this far to pre preserve their shares was so beyond disgusting that you just had to acknowledge their resilience. So, basically, Beatrice is like an assassin sent by grandfather. He probably wanted to scare the hell out of his children for talking about the inheritance without him. <laughs> Who is this Beatrice, I wonder? If everything she claims is true, then she's a mystery figure that no one knew about until, the di until today, and she also knows about grandfather's hidden gold. On top of that, she was even entrusted with the head's ring. She must truly have been trusted by him. Well, obviously I don't think she's a witch riding around on the broom, but there's no doubt she's a mysterious person who's earned the right to be called a witch. If only Maria-chan would go into more detail about that. Everyone's been smothering her, even though she's just a little girl. They really scared her, and some things they might have asked now can't be asked. I wonder if those people have ever read The North Wind and the, Wind and the, the, North Wind and the Sun. What we do know is that Maria had received a letter from a person who took the name Beatrice. She sure is shy for a mystery person, entrusting Maria with a letter and hiding away even now, when she could have just appeared and talked to us directly. <laughs> hey, Badlerkun, do you really think a person called Beatrice actually exists? Who knows? Doesn't it really seem like a false name? Like she's grandfather's representative, so she was given permission to take the name of the witch from his delusion? No, that's not what I meant. Right now, there's a total of 18 people here on Rokanjima. Do you think there's a 19th person? Are there really a full 18 people on this island right now? Wondering about that, I began counting on my fingers, and it really did come out to that many. 
Do I think that a 19th person exists? What exactly do you mean? Just what I said. The person who lent Maria that umbrella, supposedly, wasn't one of us 18. So, isn't it natural to assume that a 19th person exists? And that this person lent Maria the umbrella? Well, yeah, it sure looks that way. Then where exactly is this person now? At the very least, she must have been on the island when it started raining. And ever since that time, the weather has grown progressively worse. So taking a boat out would be pretty much impossible. In that case, that person must still be on the island, hiding from the rain somewhere, and without any of us spotting her. True, we've all been randomly prowling around all over the, pl the mansion and the guest house, but no one has bumped into a 19th person. But this island is huge. There might be other places to take shelter from the rain other than the mansion and the guest house. At about this time, I began to realize what direction Kiryasan's suspicious were taking us in. Kiryasan was denying that a 19th person existed. Beatrice was one of us 18. In other words, she thought someone we knew well was tricking us. If Beatrice is who she claims, she would surely be the most honored of guests the most honored of confidence, trusted by Grandfather. There's no way Grandfather wouldn't have given, wouldn't give that kind of person a warm reception. She would surely have been ushered into the mansion. However, we haven't seen anyone like that. Wait a sec, isn't this line of reasoning a bit too hasty? Sure, no one spotted this person, but that doesn't mean that you can deny the possibility that a 19th person exists, right? Maybe, for some reason, they landed on the island stealthily and have been hiding ever since. It's what they call a devil's proof. It's easy to prove some that something exists. If this Beatrice appears in front of us all and says hi, then it's settled. But it's impossible to prove that there's no 19th person. Yes. Battler Kunyu way of reasoning isn't bad. In our current situation, there isn't enough information to either accept or deny that a 19th person exists. But if you spin the chessboard around and think that way, we can deny the existence of a 19th person with near certainty. Spin the chessboard around was one of Kiryasan's favorite phrases. I've been influenced by those words and use them myself from time to time. When you get stuck trying to find a move in chess or shogi, then by spinning the board around and looking at everything from your opponent's standpoint, you can often see a strategy that'll give you the upper hand. It means turning things around and putting yourself in your opponent's shoes. You see? Let's say that a 19th person called Beatrice actually exists. That person must have managed, without being seen by anyone, to stealthily arrive on this island and remain hidden ever since. Maybe they had some reason, okay? In that case, why did they go to all of the trouble of appearing before Maria and handing her the letter? It really was a contradiction. If they had some reason for hiding themselves, then they should have stayed hidden the whole time. But even so, they had appeared openly in front of Maria. Then, wait, Maria said it herself. She said the witch made her a messenger. Maybe that's because Maria was the youngest and looked the most obedient. Why would they need a messenger? If they just wanted, to, wanted a letter delivered to the family conference, they could have mailed it. If they mailed it to each of the four siblings, no one would be able to ignore it. There was no need for this person to carry it themselves and secretly deliver it by hand. Yeah, that does sound pretty weird. In the first place, if Beatrice existed and wanted to make her presence known to everyone, then she could have just openly presented herself to all of us. Despite that, she chose the vague method of appearing through a little girl called Maria Chan, and only gave us a vague impression of who she was. Contradiction. Let's go a little deeper, shall we? She appeared in front of Maria, trying to give us the impression that a 19th person existed, and yet... 
She still hasn't appeared before us and is hiding somewhere at this very moment. Think about those contradictions. You've got to keep these things in mind when you spin the chessboard around. In short, if a person wants to leave us with the impression that Beatrice exists as the 19th person, what might their goal be? If this person wanted to hide, then they wouldn't have made their presence known. And if they wanted to show themselves, they wouldn't have used the roundabout approach of entrusting someone with a letter. Which means... It's simple. Beatrice is one of the 18 people. That's why they want to create the illusion that there are more than 18 people. The 19th person was revealed so spectacularly. If someone were to profit from this, it wouldn't be some 19th person in hiding, it'd be one of the original 18 people. Of course, this reasoning is full of holes. If you turn over even a few of its premises, it'll simply fall apart. But I'm almost completely certain it's correct. This is starting to feel pretty creepy. Someone lent Maria the an umbrella and handed her the letter. Supposedly, none of the 18 did this. And yet, Beatrice was hidden among those 18. Who? What was this person planning, hiding their true form and pretending to be Beatrice? I suspect it might have been Maria Chomp play acting. I suspected, even. Uh, but the contents of the message were extremely complicated, and it's hard to imagine Maria Chomp writing that herself. However, I can't deny the possibility that Maria Chomp is working together with someone. Wait a sec. The, Maria's a nine-year-old kid, right? What could she possibly be planning and with whom? And what about her straightforward, op overly honest, obedient nature? Yes, I also understand what kind of a person Maria Chan is. But that's exactly why I think it's possible. That girl's a dreamer who can't help but look up to and blindly accept the existence of witches. So, if a person appeared in front of her and claimed to be the witch of Beatrice... Maria Chan would happily swallow it up, I think. S so you're saying that if someone disguised themselves by wearing that fancy dress from the portrait, tricking Maria wouldn't be that hard? Of course, with that reasoning, all of us women would become the primary suspects. Anyway, who did Maria Chan encounter? Learning the details of that question would be the best key to solving this riddle. But this key has been firmly locked away inside Maria Chan's heart. Everyone denied the existence of the witch without listening to her, barraging, barraging her too much with questions about who Beatrice actually was. She probably won't open her heart to the adults now. In the dim hall, in front of the portrait of Beatrice, Maria was sobbing. Ooh, ooh. No one believes I met Beatrice. Ooh. Ooh. Even though I showed them the letter Beatrice gave, they still don't believe. Ooh. Ooh. Anyway, Maria Chan's holding the key. The key? to whether Beatrice is one of the 18th people or a 19th person. Maria's stubborn, right? When that girl gets angry, it's pretty hard to make it feel, but feel better. Bad luck, and I think a kid like you would be better at cheering her up than an adult like me. After, after she's feeling better, try asking. I know you don't care about all this back and forth about the inheritance, but... Don't you find this Western mansion mystery situation exciting? Who in the world is this person who gave Maria Chan the letter? It makes your intellectual curiosity ache. You're actually pretty tough considering you're still excited after being dragged through that endless money talk. Adults can be pretty amazing. I shrugged exasperatedly, but I did notice something. Kiryu noticed how dejected I was after overhearing our parents' turbulent discussion, and was probably trying to clear the air. At the very least, I'd recovered enough to voice my complaints. 
She wasn't my real mother, so I've never felt like calling her mom. But it did make me think she's a real adult. Hey, brats. So this is where you were. Cutie, you really took your time fixing your makeup, didn't you? I think I'll make a habit of going out to touch my, my makeup, too. I'm sorry. A woman's makeup takes a long time. So? How has the discussion been without me? <laughs> I'm sure everything was all peaceful and harmonious. Kiria san poked the weak spot under my arm with her elbow. We decided to take a break to cool our heads a little. It looks like we'll be at, at it all night. It makes me want to cry. His way of talking hadn't changed, but he couldn't completely hide his fatigue. I couldn't say it was sympathetic, but he looked pitiful compared to his normal, energetic self. Still, that rain is just awful. I really don't want to go back to the guest house. It looks like Natsuhine-san set up things so we could spend the night here in the mansion. What will we do? We don't need to decide until you're done, right? If you run so low on energy that you can't, can't return to our room, then we can take them upon their offer. You're right. We can think about it later. What about you, battler? If I stayed, I'd just get in the way. I'll be nice and go back over there. I see. Will you go back soon? I don't know. It'll be lonely. It'd be lonely to head back by myself. I, I'll gather all the kids and we'll head out. Okay, you go do that. Also, Balor, you won't be going to sleep that easily tonight, right? Yeah, I'll probably be up talking with the cousins. Sounds like we'll be up all night. There a problem with that? I see. If you're still awake when the adults' discussion is over, I want to have a little talk as a family. A what? That doesn't sound like you. Apparently, Kiriya-san was thinking the same thing. What are you talking about? She asked him in a small voice. It looked like Kiriya-san didn't have a clue what dad meant either. I also want to talk to you about it, Kiriya. I'll tell you later, so don't ask now. Please. I don't know anyone who neglects, neglects the concept of family as much as this old bastard. And now he's saying we're going to have a talk as a family. Thank you for the reminder. Both Kiyosan and I couldn't help but get wide-eyed. Thank you, I will save. Whoops, I hope that wasn't too loud. Don't look so terrified. I'm the one who should be terrified. After all. At that point, he swallowed his words for an instant. Even though putting on airs of importance wasn't much like my dad. You're freaking me out, Dad. Everyone in our family's gathered here now, right? Don't make a big deal out of it and spit it out. Tonight, I will probably be killed. There was a huge crash of thunder. It must have been really close. Dad's expression, brightly illuminated by the lightning, was burned into my eyes. Dad's face, which always looked so, so sure of itself, and which always wore a taunting expression, was strange, strangely frail in a way I couldn't really explain. It was so worn out that he looked like a different person. F what? What are you talking about? That doesn't sound like you. <laughs> I agree. What happened? You look so timid all of a sudden. It's not like you. I'm gonna go fix my makeup too. Don't follow me. Dad turned away, weakly. After that, only Kitty and I were left, still wide-eyed. What did he say? Tonight he'll be killed? You don't think that mysterious letter scared him, do you? He's been watching too many serial murder movies. Hmm. 
Kirisan didn't answer my lighthearted words and continued to stare at my dad's dis disappearing back. Battler Kun, when you told Rudolph san to spill the beans right away, he left without telling us anything. Even though he said he had something to say to, his, to both of us, he didn't answer you. Why? Spin the chessboard around. What do you see? Well, when he said it, he wanted to talk but then couldn't, that's a contradiction. What? Can you see something by looking from Dad's perspective? <laughs> yes, I can see something. He wants to talk about something. However, he doesn't have the courage to bring it up. So, he actually means chase after me, talk to me, and ask me about it yourself. By saying, don't follow me, he actually means the opposite. He actually means, follow me and force me to answer. Seriously, what a spoiled brat. What? Can you really call that reasoning? That's, that's ridiculous. <laughs> can great private and police detectives deduce the emotions and feelings between men and women? They can't, right? Figuring out the feelings of the opposite sex is an even more advanced art than exposing the tricks in difficult crime cases. If you ask me, romance novels have much deeper mysteries than masterpiece mystery novels. Uh, I, I see. Is, is that how it is? I'll stand alongside that spoiled brat. He normally loves to bluff, but tonight he's completely tired out from that heated discussion. He probably wants someone to lean on at the moment. And responding to that need is the role of his partner. Uh, sounds passionate. And then I'll leave that old bastard in your hands. Yes, leave it to me. I called out to Kitty Asan's departing back. Hmm? What? Um, I wanted to say thanks. Thanks to you, my gloomy mood has cleared up a lot. That's good. Communication is important. After answering with a wink, Kitty Asan followed after Dad. Natsuhi could be found in the dimly lit, dimly lit hallway. Now and then, the thunder would crash, but this had no effect on Natsuhi's expression. She looked completely worn out. The discussion that had just taken place between the relatives in the dining hall was repeating itself inside Natsuhi's mind. Beatrice had proclaimed that in addition to the gold, all of the inheritance and property of the Ushiromiya family would be given to the person who could solve the riddle. In other words, she planned to undermine the absolute guarantee that Kraus, as the oldest brother, had to succeed the family head. Originally, the other siblings had absolutely no chance to inherit the, he the headship. To them, this proposal by Beatrice was extremely desirable. It was obvious that they would accept it. There was no need to play some clumsy detective game. Natsuhi knew that the so-called 19th person, Beatrice, couldn't exist. Naturally, Beatrice was nothing more than a fictional character used to pass a message that Kinzo had written himself. As proof, Kinzo had remained stubbornly neutral as to that letter's authenticity. He was completely ignoring these reckless claims that he shouldn't be able to ignore that he had given up the head's ring. In short, Kinzo had wordlessly admitted that the letter held, held his own message. Most likely, one of the servants had given Maria the letter. Kinzo had probably worked out an elaborate plan where the dress from the portrait would be, would be prepared, and someone, probably Shannon, would be made to wear it and deliver the letter and the umbrella. By doing that, he could make it seem like the witch from the portrait actually existed. Now, if anything, that alone was proof that Kinzo was behind all this. In that case, it was the same as Kinzo trying to butt in on the siblings' private discussion. Then Kinzo, by announcing that he'd given that he'd give everything to the person who solved the riddle, could weaken Krauss's overwhelming advantage. 
Now it was certain. Kinzo had eavesdropped on the siblings' discussion in the parlor earlier that day. So he had known how Krauss had staved off the attack by the other three. And to make the scales of the battle go back into balance, he had sent out this strange letter, which benefited Krauss's rivals. He was trying to push this crazy theory so that Rosa, who had a weak position among the siblings because of her age, would join with Ava and Rudolph. Then, with a three to one advantage, they'd be able to overwhelm Krauss yet again and make their ridiculous theories get accepted by force. And by doing that, he gave them the power to resettle what had once been a nearly decided conflict. They had now started repeatedly pressing Krauss to pay them a large amount of money, using the condition that all of the siblings would, would guarantee Krauss's position as the successor. Talk about advanced payments was being brought up again, despite having been rejected once. Of course, even without the story about the hidden gold, the Ushiromiya family's store of wealth was, store of wealth was vast. That store of wealth alone was more than enough. Even if the hidden gold was buried forever along with Kinzo's death, there would still be more than enough to satisfy. Therefore, even if they weren't that interested in the gold itself, Kinzo had managed to instill the lifelong fear that, on the off chance that someone found the gold, that person would be granted the headship. And this kind of Achilles heel would definitely be taken advantage of by someone sooner or later. The only person with this fatal weakness was the successor, Kraus. The other siblings had found, no, they had been told by Kinzo about something that only Kraus could lose, and they had died click too quick for that one. And I don't know how to open the log if I can. Oh, I can't. Had thoroughly taken advantage of that. Natsuhi, as Krauss's only ally in this, in his painful position and as his wife, wanted to fight alongside him. She kept trying to explain to him that the existence of the goal itself was a farce and that there was no need for him to compromise. Krauss had always told Natsuhi. He had told all of the siblings. He always, always said that the hidden gold was nothing more than an illusion created by Kinzo. Therefore, Natsuhi had believed it as his wife and had supported her husband on that foundation. Even so, Natsuhi's words didn't reach Kraus. Even though Natsuhi had fought so hard and had lent all of her strength, he continued to fight by himself and was trying to compromise with the other three siblings. Natsuhi sadly and weakly wondered why she could not be of use to him, then started getting angry. It had happened when everyone decided to take a, a short break to cool their heads. Natsuhi had flared up against Kraus. Enraged, she had asked why she could not be useful to him. He had then told her that he wanted to talk about something, and invited her into a room that she was normally not allowed to enter. That room had been sealed with a heavy-looking padlock, and just looking at it had given her an uncomfortable feeling. There's no need for you to worry about anything said by those three, or even this suspicious person who calls herself Beatrice. After all, the gold is just a ruse created by father. There's no way something like that could be found. Your position as the successor is a solid fact. What are you afraid of? Kraus removed the padlock on the door. He then motioned for Natsuhi to enter. Enter. What is this? There's something I want you to see. I've never shown you this before. Natsuhi timidly opened the door with a dubious expression on her face. It was pitch black. She searched for a switch to turn on the lights. But since this was her first time in the room, she didn't know where it was. Kraus entered behind her, pushing her in, and when he closed the door before turning on the lights, the two were swallowed up by the darkness. Only the sound of Kraus locking the door rang out through the dark. But what are you doing? The lights. I'm turning them on now. Wait. Just as he said, when Kraus pushed a switch on the wall, 
a flickering light turned on and lit up the room. The, that that is. Natsuki had her breath had her breath taken away. The room had no windows, and at a glance, it appeared to be empty. In the middle of the room, a small round table had been set, and the lights bright brightened only brightened only that table as if it were the leading part in a play. On top of the table, a red tablecloth of elaborate design had been set out, covered with dust. And on top of that, something about the size of a grown man's arm had been set down. That something took Natsuhi's breath away. It's a gold ingot of incredible purity. Without this, no one would have believed in the legend of the gold. It was an ingot of solid gold. Even in the faint light, it sparkled with a noble and dignified glint. This is not a proper ingot. I don't even know whether it was cast inside or outside the country. It took a high level of skill to make the purest of solid gold, the gold ingots. And in order, to, in order to verify the purity, it was standard to have the original foundry in the name of the bank that guaranteed it imprinted on the gold. However, this ingot didn't ha did not have that kind of seal. This mysterious gold bar had come from an unknown foundry. Look here. There's nothing to be afraid of. It's just a bar of gold. Natsuhi, following Krauss's words, timidly approached the ingot. Right here. Krauss pointed up the surface of the ingot. Natsuhi concentrated on that section. Right there was the thin imprint of the one-winged eagle crest. Natsuhi's breath was taken away once again. That's right. This is the legendary ingot that father said he received from the witch that the president of Marso witch witnessed and was allowed to select at random to take back with him, that gained the trust of the fixers in the business world. I had to use all possible means to find it. I found it before the other siblings could. How could, then, the legend of father's gold is... It actually exists. The gold that Ushiromi Akinza received from Beatrice actually exists. Impossible! So, so it really does exist. Not so he was shocked. Krauss had always said that Kinza's gold was just a fabrication. So she had believed it as his wife. However, the reality was different. Since he held definite proof, he had been more certain than any of the other siblings that the legend of the gold was true. Because of this, Krauss was deeply frightened at the possibility that someone other than himself would find the gold he failed to find, costing him everything. But to Natsuhi, this truth was more than enough to split open her heart. She had thought that as Krauss's wife, she would be his closest confidant, which was why she had selflessly supported him. And yet, he had hid this fact from her until today. Why? Have I been so undeserving of your trust? That has never been my intention. There was simply no need to tell you. I... Is that all a... A wife means to you? Calm down. Becoming passionate easily is one of your bad habits. You're the one who's making me like that, aren't you? I've been supporting you as a wife ever since I married into this family. For your sake, I threw away the family I was born into, and I've been offering up my heart and my body to serve you. And in return, this is what I get. How could... How could you? Krauss grimaced, looking annoyed. His expression effectively communicated how much he disliked this part of Natsuhi, even if he didn't say it out loud. It doesn't look like I will be of any use to you anymore. Hmm. That's fine. I can resolve the troubles with the siblings by myself. I don't need your help. That's wrong. This is the Ushiromiya's family's problem. 
It's true that I am not permitted to wear the family crest on my body, but I am still your wife. Even so, are you saying I'm not capable of helping you? Are you? I especially wouldn't want to risk getting you involved. It would probably make your headaches even worse than they are now. Take a rest for today. The siblings will deal with the siblings' problems. It has nothing to do with you. That is all. A dull headache tormented Natsuhi. No matter what medicine she took, no matter what sense she burns, it wouldn't heal. In fact, simply wandering alone through the dark corridors and listening to the sound of the rain seemed to be a better cure. I may be Natsuhi, but I was never Ushiromiya Natsuhi. I have been despised and treated as a borrowed womb and insulted when I couldn't even fill that role. Even so, I have tried to properly perform my duties as a wife. But now even my husband has rejected me. I've done my best raising my daughter, as if it were the last job left to me. However, I've had no release from my anger and sadness, and they've caused me to subconsciously strain that relationship too. Because I've been excessively strict in Jessica's education, she dislikes me thoroughly. She despises me for having no interest in anything but grades. There is no longer anything I can do for the Ushiromiya family. No. No, that's no good. Despite it all, I must help my husband and feed back the schemes of the other greedy siblings. The family head won't be around much longer. Eventually, Krauss will succeed the head, and the next successor will be Jessica. Strictly speaking, the man who enters the family by marrying Jessica will become the next head, but it all comes down to the same thing. I have to make Jessica an excellent su successor, whom everyone will accept as worthy to take over the Ushiromiya family. In the days to come, that greedy Ushiromiya Eva will probably be plotting to find some fault with the main family. And if all goes as she plans, Jessica will be dragged down from the su succession with George set up in her place. It is regrettable, but George is a man, and even more, has matured as a person, compared to Jessica, who is right in the middle of a rebellious period and whose grades are slightly below average. It can be seen at a glance who is more fit to succeed the head. So, in order to secure Jessica's position, I need to turn her into an excellent person. After doing that, I want to find her an excellent husband, worthy of the excellent person she will have become. A wonderful man who will truly accept Jessica and stay with her through all of life's joys and sorrows. Was Natsuhi trying to entrust her daughter with fulfilling some desire of her own? Natsuhi thought back to the days when she'd had no choice but to marry into the Ushiromiya family. Because of that unavoidab unavoidable fate, she had tried to block that from her memory. She had consciously forgotten it, and had actively attended to the life she'd been given as Ushiromiya Natsuhi. And in doing so, she had built up a new life. But just now, it felt like all of that had been casually rejected. How should I think as I live my life? I do not know. Natsuhi helplessly rested her head against the glass of the window. The glass, which was cool thanks to the raindrops beating against it, felt somehow refreshing, even though it should have been emotionless. Right then it seemed to be the only thing that could understand Natsuhi. At that point, even if someone had appeared, Natsuhi didn't intend to pay any attention to them. But she did pay attention, because it was her beloved daughter. Oh, it's you, Mom. What the heck are you doing in a place like this? I thought you were a ghost. Just like always, her words were rough and not at all like a girl's. Instinctively, words of rebuke rose to Natsuhi's throat. However, their strength gave out and they didn't escape her lips. Jessica, 
Forgive me, but my headache is awful. Please leave me be. I see. Jessica was seeing her mother in a position of feebleness for the first time, so she was consider considerably disconcerted. Until just now, she'd been filled with contempt for all of the parents, including her mother. But now those feelings have been completely swept away. Her mother's, her mother's utterly exhausted face had wiped them all out. In its place, the words George had told her floated back up in her mind. Our parents are doing their best in their own way. And because their families are counting on them, they can't afford to keep everything pleasant and have a heavy responsibility to fight. Maybe her mother had been standing around in this dimly lit hallway because no one had tried to understand that in her. Jessica hated her mother, so she had no intention of speaking kindly to Natsuhi just because she was looking a bit frail. So when she attempted to speak kindly to her mother anyway, she had to clench her fists and gather up the words from deep in her heart. It sounds like you've really got your hands full with that meeting thing. It has nothing to do with you. Please go somewhere else. It, is your headache bad? Should I go get some medicine? You, you don't have to trouble yourself. Please, leave me alone. Natsuhi wasn't being cold. She just wanted her daughter to go far away so that she wouldn't have to bump against Natsuhi's own short temper. But there was no chance that Jessica would realize this. Uh, okay. Jessica hung her head, looking sad. Seeing that expression, Natsuhi recognized the kindness that Jessica was trying to muster. She gave her head a small shake to drive away her own unkind feelings. Then I'll leave. I'll be with the other cousins so I don't get in the way of the adults. See you later. Wait here. She called Jessica, who was trying to leave and looked lonely, to a stop. What? Thank you for being so considerate. It isn't good of me to go to sleep and leave you alone. D don't talk like that, you'll bring bad luck. I made you worried, but I'm okay now. I will go. If I let my daughter see me this feeble any longer, I'll only make her feel more uneasy. With that thought in mind, Natsuhi left Jessica with words of gratitude and made to depart. This time, Jessica called out to her mother's back. Natsuhi stopped and turned around, asking what business Jessica had with her. But Jessica herself didn't know why she'd stopped her mother. And for a while, she smiled wryly, muttering to herself as she hesitated over what to say. She was poking around in her pocket when her hand touched something, and she took it out. Um, hey, Mom. I, uh, was given a charm today. What, what was it? A charm against magic? Uh, um, I'm pretty sure that you were supposed to hang it from your doorknob, I think. <laughs> I, I, for, I forget. There's no point in me having it, so I'll let you take it. It was the scorpion charm that Maria had given her on the beach. Although she'd heard of its various effects from Maria, Jessica's mind had gone blank, and she was just barely able to say even that much. Jessica, thinking that her mother probably wouldn't accept it anyway, immediately drew back the hand she had stuck out, grasping the charm. So when Natsuhi came back to take it, she was extremely shocked. What is this? Some kind of prize toy? W well, it's... I think it's something like that. I guess you wouldn't really expect a charm that looks like a toy to do anything. But her mother took the charm from where she grasped it in her hand. Thank you. I'll take good care of it. Sometime soon, in exchange, why don't I give you a charm that was important to me when I was a child? It's not like that's why I gave it to you, it, but, well, if you really say so, then I will rest for now. My headache is awful. Try not to stay up too late. Sure. 
Natsuki put the charm in her pocket and turned away. She then disappeared into the dark hall. Okay, and that's where I'm gonna leave it for today. Because, oh my god, there's so much... There... <laughs> There's there's still more to come before like the actual meat of the story sort of happens. It, it, this is a very long novel. It's not even a game. It's a novel. Uh, yeah. So that's gonna be it. You know, honestly, I could keep going for like another hour, but it it's it's like after two a.m. already. I, I could play through the whole... I, initially, the first time I played these, most of them I just played in one or two sittings. And that, like, that takes hours. Like, hours, hours. This is one of the shorter ones. <laughs> it's kind of insane. Uh, but, you know, in a, in a, in a good way. Jeez, um, yeah, we're not there yet, and there's like a, there's some more character development happening, and then, and then, and then the mystery happens. So that's gonna be, that's definitely gonna be next time, so I'm really hyped for that, actually. Uh, and, you know, we got some spooky shit here, we got a witch, who may or may not be real. We got a 19th person on the island, who may or may not be real. We got the gold, which... Uh, apparently totally real or is it who knows i know but y'all don't know so uh i'm a little sleepy if you can't tell so yeah i really like if i want to actually read this properly i definitely need to go sleep um but next week you know uh just gonna keep going same time as today my schedule is on my about page and thank you all so so much for being here for lurking for all of you in the chat uh i'm just really jazzed that i get to share this game with all of you and uh as always i'm going to put the highlights uh, the highlight of this in a uh playlist so that you can like catch up if you feel like it Keep in mind that Twitch lets you play stuff at like two times the speed so you don't have to sit through the whole three hours and then some. You know, make, make life a little easier on yourself. Uh, if not, I'm going to do a recap at the beginning next time. Um, the recaps are going to like start getting more and more generic because there's just too many little details. I can't get all of them because then, you know, you just need to play the whole game. Ooh, okay. Um, yeah, so next year, actually, we're going to be back with another uh, episode of this. And I hope you're all going to be there. <laughs>